Hi everyone, welcome. It's testing your sound here. Welcome to SDEC eTrack. Just letting the room fill up. All right, so it looks like um, it's the trickling of people has slowed down a bit. Stephen, how's that? Oh. Someone in the room. Okay, well, I think I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so thank you guys for coming. This is the Stack E-Track. And I have just a few little slides for the opener here before we get started, talk about what's going to happen tonight. So um, if you so if you were here last time, we had breakout rooms and um, we were able to quickly figure out what kind of breakout rooms to to um, to create. But today, so the, the breakout rooms will come at the end of the of the program tonight. But if you want what we'd like you to do is put in the chat either your industry or platform, and then we can get a sense of who's really here and create breakout room uh, to fit the group that we have today. We'll just give you a suggestion here on the slides. We had health, we had last time we had a healthcare, we had biotech and life science separate, we had software SaaS and or apps. I would call that SaaS and apps. If you wanna do apps. And then there's <laughs> food and beverage, and consumer packaged goods, which might be combined. And since we have Benton here, we got, if you if we get a clean tech, we have a nice clean tech breakout room with Benton moderating that would be really cool. So these are just my suggestions. Um, feel free to put whatever you want in there. We're gonna try to like get a mass around, you know, common theme there. So go ahead and uh, put that in. And then the breakout rooms come, will come at the end of the evening and we have plenty of time to sort through that create those rooms so all right so uh, as you guys know we are I'm I'm the Amy Duncan I'm the director of the brink and we I'm part of FEI and we are housed at the University of San Diego and we are in the Canal School of Business a great business program we have um, grad students from the School of Business in the MBA program and the Masters of Science of Business Analytics working on our staff so um we just want to give a big shout out to our hosts who are doing great things over there. And if you get a chance to come to our Pitch D construction, you can come to that beautiful campus whose mission is to advance academic excellence and hope for a more sustainable, hopeful, and, um, oh my God, I don't have my card in front of me. Sustainable, hopeful world. Oh, yeah. All right. So we want to thank our sponsors. Um, C3 Bank, if any of you guys were at Startup San Diego last night, you got to hear the keynote from Viore, who referenced that he was working in the garage, the founder of C3 Bank. So they're doing a lot for our community. Uh, we also have Kenobi Martins, who does IP, Mints, with them for valuations, and Clearpoint Agency for PR. And of course, Coeptis, the Brian Dirkmat from Coeptis will be running uh, our legal, one of our e-tracks on corporate legal basic basics, uh, First Republic, Seraph, and UCSD, and San Diego State. Uh, of course, we want to thank our partners. If you, We have this vibrant ecosystem supporting our founders in San Diego, and that was like on full force at San Diego Startup Week last night. Um, we have Tanya Hens is going to be speaking tonight, and she's from the REC Innovation Lab, well, one of our ecosystem partners here, and we have... Um, well, SDEE, that's another group I'm affiliated with, and Benton is affiliated with Clean Tech. And of course, I want to give a special shout out to the SBA, the Small Business Administration, and the Calo SBA, the fund, the brink, and uh, the advising that we provide. And of course, the Calo SBA, they are up in Sacramento providing funding so that we can provide free one-on-one um, -on -one advising to you guys. They're going to be here meeting with me and my team on November 14th. And we scheduled that day because we wanted them to stay and attend the pitch deconstruction. So we would love it if you could come out and do the, to our pitch deconstruction. It's gonna be at USD. Our funders are gonna be there. They fund us to help train you guys to pitch. And we wanna show them what 
the effect of the impact of their program is dead. So the funding really helps us reach out to diverse founders who are developing innovations. And so we want to show the impact of their funding. You can scan this QR code or you can't click on that link, but um, if you go to vsdangels.com slash events, if we're here on the left on the bottom, make sure you uh, sign up, register, and attend that event in person. Okay, we also have something else new that is coming up in November, the AI Roundtable on November 4th at 4 p.m. at USD. We have our Brink advisors, Pankaj Kedia, Jerisa Mali, and Sami Shahabi. We'll be talking about AI in different industries. And so you can see it's a great fit if you are a startup founder, which I think all of you are, if you have an AI platform in any of those verticals, healthcare, consumer, fintech, or marketing, um, pre-seed and seed, seed stage. So there, there is the um, QR code. If you missed it, we can put a link in the chat. So we're um, space is limited, so register today. And then one other thing we have, we partner with Village Up, Julius Alejandro, and he's doing a second state of diverse founder survey. Um, we do this every year. You can see how things are progressing. So if you want to, we'd love for you to help out and contribute. And there's a link here, a QR code. And if, you, if, if we can put that in the chat as well. All right. So as I said, I'm, I'm with The Brink, SBDC. We're part of the Free Enterprise Institute, which is led by the executive director, Misty Rusk, who's joining us tonight. She'll be doing part of the programming. And Free Enterprise Institute uh, ranges from student-facing event, student events to total community-facing events, like the San Diego Angel Conference and The Brink. And The Brink, SBDC advising is open to everybody. It's not, you don't have to be affiliated, affiliated with USD. It is open to everybody in the community, founders, innovative founders who want, who need advice. Okay, so just real quick, because we have such a great team supporting us here. We have Misty Rusk on the left, the executive director of the FBI, and Stacey Pena, the assistant director, and also Taya Clement, who's here today, the senior program coordinator, will be helping us with our breakout rooms. Part, as part of the brink, we have Stephen Flynn, who you've probably received lots of emails about before and after the event, and um, Claire Morlay on the right, bottom right. She's the one that's been handing all of our promotions and awareness and social media. That's who's sending those promotional emails and putting those um, posts up on LinkedIn. And then Shira, if you do sign up to be a Brink client, the first person you'll meet with is Shira, uh, who will do an intake and then find the right Brink advisor for you. So the Brink, we provide free one-on-one -on -one advising and training to help innovative founders access capital to build investable companies. We are part of a larger network of 11 centers across San Diego. Um, we've generated over 300, at the brink alone, 375 million of capital for our clients, and that's through grant funding or angel investment. And so if you want to be a brink client, scan that QR code and sign up. Uh, you do not have to be a brink client to participate in SDAC. So what is SDAC, the San Diego Angel Conference? It is a series of entrepreneur training events called E-Track. That's what we're doing right now. It's four months. Every Tuesday, we train entrepreneurs to really prepare them to pitch for angel investing. And then um, we also activate accredited, of angel, accredited angels in the local community to learn how to be uh, an angel investor. We get about 100 and over 100 applications. They, through a series of gating votes, they get down to six finalists where they'll perform due diligence. And those finalists will uh, present on stage at the final event on May 9th. Uh, and the investors pool their money to award an investment to the winner. And usually we uh, we are, have enough funds to uh, award to several companies. So if you um, apply to uh, a pitch, you get a free ticket to the event. And uh, and the goal is to is to raise 200,000, at least 200,000 to award in the to award as, as an investment to the winner. And that happens every year. It's usually more than that. If you don't win, you will be exposed to investors. You will get to meet your peers. Um, the, those investors will remember you and they come back as you make progress. So it's just definitely a great way to immerse yourself in the ecosystem. Okay, so today we are um, on the 24th doing product market fit, market opportunity and customer discovery next week will be, um, it'll be in person the day after Halloween. So it will be on Wednesday 
And um, we have Kelsey Chase coming. He's going to be addressing competition. And um, he's going to have some founders that he'll interview to discuss that as well. And um, trying to line up um, an IP attorney to talk about IP, which is part of your competitive strategy. And then, of course, the application deadline is December 19th if you're going to apply to compete in SDAC. And so, and remember, save the date on your calendar. May 9th is the big grand, grand finale celebration. So tonight, we're going to kick it off with Benton Moore. He's going to talk about customer discovery. He actually leads. He's one of our Brink advisors. He leads our Lean Essential Sprint workshop series, which is kicking off this week. So uh, if you're part of that, you will get really immersed in customer discovery. And then we have Joshua Peltz, who was uh, who won SDAC this year, earlier this year, and his company is Limber. I make 3D prosthetic legs and one piece that, um, 3D printed. And he's going to have a fireside chat with uh, Misty Rusk. And then Tanya Hentz will talk about carts. We'll talk about um, market opportunity and product market fit. She is with the Rec Innovation Lab uh, at San Diego Miramar College and a lecturer at San Diego State. And then we will start the breakout rooms around eight o'clock. So with that, Misty, do you have any words you want to add before we start with the program? She's good. All no, right. I'm here. I'm I, but I don't have anything to add. So um, I'm excited about the lineup and uh, ready to get going. Awesome. All right. So our first speaker, let me introduce Benton Moore, who I've met through the San Diego Angel Conference. He was a manager, the fund manager of uh, SDAC2. This, he is the fund manager of that second fund. And he's also a Brink advisor. Like I said, he leads our Lean Essential Sprint series. He also runs the Digging for Fire. And uh, he's in his area that he invests in is clean tech. And so with that, I will introduce Benton Moore. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Misty. Good to see everybody. Um, especially awesome to share the Zoom stage with uh, Joshua and Tanya. Uh, Joshua is a company we've invested in twice in the last year. And Tanya is a colleague who uh, is all over town at many of the universities and entrenched in the entrepreneurship scene. So uh, a great evening tonight. Let me get this going. Um, All right. Do we have audio? Do we have video? All good. All right. Um, tonight, I want to talk about customer discovery. It is the lifeblood of startups and really any successful business. Um, as Amy said, I run a nine-week workshop that we call the Lean Essentials Sprint, and it's very intense. Um, we spend at least a month doing customer discovery interviews. And at the end of the nine week program, our entrepreneurs and some of you are in the program right now, come out with three big things. The business model canvas, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. And it's a one page blueprint with everything about your business. So when you can distill your whole business down into one page, you really can communicate with anyone, whether it's an investor or co-founder. Uh, so it's a great takeaway. The hardest work and where we see most entrepreneurs really struggle and this is the grind of entrepreneurship is in customer discovery and if you're doing it right if you're out there talking to customers and really formulating your value proposition which is the hinge pin of the business model canvas you're going to be talking to maybe hundreds and hundreds of potential customers and one-on-one -on -one long hour hour and a half sessions sometimes so it really is grueling and the other thing you come out of the only essential sprint with is your ability to do a 60 second pitch uh, to anyone. So I really want to talk about customer discovery tonight, um, keeping in mind that it is no way we can cover it in 45 minutes. And most of this is going to be high level. If you're interested in doing more of it, you can take the LES workshop or you can reach out and we can talk about it through the brink. So big picture with with customer discovery is you know as phds as engineers as problem solvers as entrepreneurs we're designed to figure out solutions and sometimes we come up with things that the market doesn't need the whole idea of customer discovery is to understand 
really what the problem is. Identify the problem coming from the day in the life of your customer. And if you can do that, then you can come up with the solution. So what we want to get away from is these companies that raise $10 million and think they have a go-to-market strategy and a solution that everyone's going to want, and then they build it and nothing happens. Um, we've, we've seen it over and over again, and this is, this is the best way to do it. And unfortunately, you don't always hear from the customer exactly what you want to hear, but you really hear the truth. And if you come out of customer discovery with anything, this sentence, customers love us because, as an investor, it's one of my favorite lines. If an entrepreneur can tell me why customers love their product, they have traction, they have sales, they have obsessed customers, I know that most of the, the, risk, the risk has been mitigated in the company. So that's a, that's a very mm, lay way of saying the value proposition. And it's really addressing the customer's pains and the gains. Uh, so I'm coming to you tonight um, as uh, an advisor from the Brink. I'm a graduate of USD's business school, so I'm happy to be back. I really love everything that's going on with uh, the new business school. Uh, as Amy said, we're part of the SDAC, uh, and this is the E-Track. I do a lot of things with other schools and other groups, including Clean Tech San Diego and the MIT Sustainability Initiative. I was an entrepreneur before I uh, joined in the gig economy and becoming a full-time investor here. Um, so that's who I am. I wanna show you kind of what we do as a starter through the LES curriculum. It's nine weeks and two of those weeks we spend on customer discovery in the class and four of those outside the class. And as you can see, 60% of our time during that workshop is really focused on customers. That's how important it is. Uh, Steven, do you have a poll that you can throw up there? Uh, sorry, which one would you like? Uh, the first one, please. So this is a good um, good snapshot of what customer discovery should not be. Talking to one person and convincing them that your cool idea is ready to go to market. All right. Come on, robots. All right, most of you are heading in the right direction. Yes, most startups fail um, for two reasons, cash and capital, obviously, but customers is the number one reason startups fail. Good job. Um, so here's a snapshot of the business model canvas that I know some of you have seen. If you go to the center there, the value proposition, that's where good customer discovery, after you talk to 50, 100 customers and can really distill down your hypothesis and test it and validate it, that's when you'll come up with a true value proposition. And everything on the right side of the BMC is really the front of the house dealing with customers and as you go through discovery, that's where this starts to take shape. So this is a fold out of value prop. Um, this is an example from Uber. And if you think about life before Uber, it was very different, right? So you can imagine um, in Uber's customer discovery, the team going out, talking to people in airports, talking to people who are waiting for taxis, who are riding buses, um, and really understanding what it would be like if you're at 2 a.m. in a strange city trying to get a ride from a cab and not knowing the local cab. And the more you do customer discovery, the more you understand what the number one pain is. And for different different folks, it might be might be different things. But if you do enough, you'll start to recognize trends. And then that will tell you what the customer jobs are. Obviously for Uber, it's to get from A to B, but it might be other things too. Um, and you know they've expanded and added food um, and it's really a two-sided marketplace. And if you think about the customer being the driver sometimes, um, customer discovery can be really complicated. So they have a lot of different hypotheses that they tested and what they found out was you know, um, doing things digitally 
and having a fleet of roaming car owners was much better than the existing model. So based on customer discovery, they were able to analyze the market, talk to their customers and really disrupt the marketplace as we all know. So where does this customer discovery concept come from? Well, the origin story uh, goes back to a guy named Steve Blank. Um, he came up with the epiphany of the answers are outside of the building. So get out of the building was his mantra. Um, he taught classes at Berkeley and Stanford, and one of his students along the way was um, a young Eric Reese, who had written many business plans um, and took the customer discovery model and wrote the Lean Startup. So the two of these are cornerstone. If you haven't read them, they're classics, uh, easy reads, um, and really a backbone of everything we do in the Lean Essentials Sprint and anything you're gonna do in customer discovery goes back to here. So let's look at the process. Customer discovery is really the first of four parts of what's a customer development process. And customer discovery is the getting out of the building and talking to people and finding out if your brilliant idea that you think is gonna be a business is viable. And to do that, you have to go through what we call customer validation. So that's a continuous loop sometimes. So you take your hypotheses and you go out into the field and you talk to people and you find out some of them are great ideas, some of them are not. And if they're not a great idea, you pivot, right? So it might be adding benefits and features that you didn't think were important early, or it might be doubling down on the one thing that you really, that everyone seems to like. And over and over, as you do more and more customer discovery, you're able to refine your offering. And then you start thinking about going to market. A lot of people just want to build a sales funnel, do some social media, and then throw it out in the market. And that's why you see uh, a lot of startups burning through $10, $20 million in, in uh, pointless advertising funds early on because they haven't done customer discovery. After you've validated your value prop, then you can move into the execution phase. And that's where you get into customer creation and company building and some of the things that Tanya is going to be speaking about in go to market. So like I said, this is um, can be very technical and this is um, grueling because imagine this workflow times a hundred. Imagine you have to go and sit and talk to someone for an hour one-on-one -on -one, and listen to all of their pains, gripes, and talk about whatever it is they're using in the market that you're trying to replace without being able to sell them. So this is what you need to do. And trust me, it works. And I know it works because I did it with my business. Um, but you have to take your hypothesis and maybe your baby isn't as cute as you think it is. And that can be really tough to hear, but you, you take your product and the ideas about it and you put it out in the market and you go through your problem hypothesis and then you get through if uh, there is a market for that, then you do a reality check and then you test your product. After you do this loop continually over and over again for dozens and dozens of times, you finally get to the business model where you can actually present something. And at that point, you either iterate or exit if it's not working. So this is the process. And um, like I said, this comes from not just Steve Blank's work, but he pioneered all of the work that's being done at the National Science Foundation. So National Institute of Health, DOD and DOE to a lesser extent, but these long programs um, of customer discovery and customer development, where you talk to 100, 100 potential customers, do lengthy interviews and then write reports. Um, it's a government backed program, but it takes a year. So imagine trying to do this in, in a month. And that's why we call the uh, Lean Essential Sprint a sprint. We really try and flush out what's a good idea and what's a poor idea early so that you can iterate, you can pivot and get put all of your money and your, your energy into building what's right. So let's see. Um, I, I, I can talk about, yeah, let's talk about Airbnb. This was, this was a classic example of 
a company that did things right. They went through Y Combinator, so they had a, a boost up in the market to begin with. But instead of taking in a lot of venture capital early and then seeing if it worked, the founders actually went out in the field. Not only did they go to every every property that was a rental and stay there and check it out, they also talked to every renter and every owner and found out what exactly was important about that place. And they had they had customer discovery that went, please rank the unit you rented from one to ten. And then beyond that, what what could what would be ideal? Like if the if the unit came with a golf cart, if the unit came with a car, if the unit came with champagne, if the unit came with your own private um, concert, and let people just tell them every crazy idea. And obviously that wasn't part of the original rollout, but if you look at Airbnb you know, 10 years later, they do have some of these crazy ideas. You can go and stay in a spaceship in New Mexico. You can they put some of this stuff into, into play. But what they really found out were, after talking to hundreds and hundreds of uh, customers, what was the most important thing? And so they knew how to price things, how to offer them. And then they also made a lot of pivots along the way um, and got you know entrenched into dealing with governments and and how to make that a smoother smoother process for all of the owners. Um, so it was a great success story. Um, Stephen, would you launch the second poll, please? Hey, Benton, do you want him to share the results of the first poll? Because if he doesn't do that, I think he's going to lose them. Oh, yes. I thought everyone could see that. Thanks, Misty. Yeah. Here, let me share that real quick. Um, I can share the results here. Are you able to see them? Yes. So... Yeah, some, sometimes founders don't get a loan. Sometimes you can't build the product and sometimes you can't get the capital. Um, <laughs> someone took the robots. Uh, maybe this maybe this will happen. But yes, most businesses fail because there's no one in the market. Uh, customers don't want it and there's no product market fit. So understanding your customers is vital. All right, let me uh, do the next one. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so this is how many customer discovery interviews should you do before you decide to go to market? I think someone says none. My idea is genius. Yeah, so most of you are spot on. Um, for NIH and the government programs, 100 is kind of the minimum. And for most customer discovery that we see that is viable and really tested, you start to see patterns somewhere around 70 discovery interviews in. Um, that means don't stop at 50 because you might not be seeing the, the patterns that you need. Uh, 70 is kind of the, the magic number. 100 is is what you need to get get to. And over time, you'll, you know, as you get to 50, your interview questions become more targeted and your sessions become more productive. So, all right, you guys are listening. You got it. So customer discovery, the number one reason 42% of startups fail, no market need, and then they ran out of cash. There's the second one. Like I said, it all comes down to customers and capital, C and C. So um, if you have customers, if you have growth, um, 
most likely you will be able to find the capital. So it's almost customers and capital is almost a cause and effect relationship. It's not just two of the same things. And it's important because we're trying to do one of the hardest things as humans when you're introducing the new product or service to the market. You're trying to modify behaviors. And that's a that's a psychology undertaking. So if you think you're going to go out and modify people's human behaviors without understanding them, it's you're going down a really rough path. Um, one of the one of the concepts of doing really good customer discovery interviews is to interview for empathy. And the reason this is a grind and it takes so long is you have to build trust and you can't just sit down with someone and find out everything about their life and what they use and what they buy and how they spend their money and what they like and don't like in five minutes. It takes a while and you have to introduce yourself and build rapport and eventually you'll find out what they like and dislike and then you'll be able to capture some data. Um, but the hard thing is your your inclination is always to sell. and. As an entrepreneur, you're always selling your services. You're always trying to pitch your company to anyone who listens. You're a believer. You know it's a great idea. And when you get into these customer discovery interviews, you can't do that because as soon as you hear, as a as a as someone on the other side, as soon as you hear a sales pitch, you go into defense mode and you stop talking about yourself and you don't want to hear it. So really, it's, uh, it really is uh, getting your subjects to tell stories, talk about a day in the life, talk about what they use right now and what kind of things are out there in the market that you might be replacing. So the customer interviewing process is really a loop and you start by developing a hypothesis and you turn that then into interview questions, you test them in the market and then you come back and look at the results and you keep doing it until you really have a clear understanding. So we, we take a scientific approach, but that's really a little bit of an art form too. And hypothesis is really just an educated guess, as Steve Blank calls it. It's a $50 word um, because we don't know. We really don't know if our great idea is going to test in the market. And it's a prediction of cause and effect. And we conduct experiments to either support or refute. And as we get into it, most good hypotheses are if-then statements. Uh, it can also be an I or we believe. So, you know, you might be looking at electric vehicles and you say, um, I, my hypo hypothesis is if gasoline is $7 an hour, then 50% of the cars sold will be electric vehicles. And then you can go out in the market and you can test that assumption. You can talk to people about their pricing behavior. You can talk to people about what they spend on gasoline and why they want an electric vehicle. Um, but you can't just assume until you know. So here's another um, a basic statement of hypothesis. If then, I, we believe the customer will do this action or use this solution for this reason. And that's something that you can take each part of that and test in the marketplace. So here's a, a, a more detailed if-then example. If a screening assay will accurately identify ovarian cancer patients who are resistant or refractory to platinum-based chemotherapy, then oncologists will use it as part of their standard of care to develop a treatment plan using second-line options. Very detailed, but this is the kind of granularity that's required for good customer discovery interviews. And here's another one. We believe that veterinarians will convert to and prescribe an anti-parasite drug if it will reduce harmful environmental impacts through its production methods and provides optimal treatment efficacy. So a lot of things to pull apart and test in the field. So these are really good um, NIH uh, examples of hypotheses. These. So as you get out in the field, um, it's really easy to, as I said, start thinking like a sales rep and pushing your product. And when you're doing customer discovery, it's really more like investigative journalism or really mining for 
precious gems, right? It's digging, it's patience, it's waiting for epiphanies to come and really seeing patterns. Um, I like this kid, he's our, our field guide. You know, remember when you were five or four and everything was why, why, why? That's really what good customer discovery is like. You're really just taking notes, trying to understand, asking a lot of why questions. Okay, tell me about your, how your day starts. Tell me about the last time you spent more than $100 on this item. Did you like it? Why did you like it? And it can be, it can sound uh, really infantile, but saying why, why, why over and over again um, is really the best, best way to do things. So you're out there in the field. Um, how are we doing on time? Um, this is very granular and I apologize, but I'm trying to cram in a lot of stuff into a short period of time. And it's very important for the survival of your business. So bear with me and we'll uh, we'll get through this. Um, so developing the interview questions. So you can ask things like this, open-ended questions. What, how, what do you think? What would you like to see in an ideal world? This is a great question because um, it just allows everyone's imagination. And maybe there's something out there that hasn't been done yet and you can come in and create it, right? And the whole idea is you wanna create what people want, not what people already have and not what you think people want. So these are some other, other good examples of interview questions. What's your current fuel usage? What measures do you have in place? Um, this is for a public transit authority. This was actually a real um, NIH uh, situation. And it ended with, uh, you know, tell me about the accident reduction improvements you've made over the past 10 years, how effective have they been? And the takeaway from this is you can get very granular and each one of these questions is a lead in to a conversation that could be 20 minutes. And finding out all of this information from customers is tricky. So um, the big takeaway is when you do customer interviews, you wanna have open-ended, you don't wanna have yes or no questions, you don't wanna have true false, but why questions, how, tell me about this. Um, boy, that sounds like a real hassle. Can you tell me how you fixed it or what did you do in this, in this emergency? How did you deal with that? And then you can go back and uh, take all of your notes and try and figure out the patterns and figure out if you can do it better. And that's where you build solutions. So um, some nuts and bolts. When you're in customer discovery, uh, the best way to do it is one-on-one -on -one in person. Um, has been proven scientifically. But uh, we started doing this in 2020 and found out um, Zoom is pretty good, and we've been able to actually reach a lot of people that are decision makers that normally you wouldn't be able to sit in a room with. You're just not going to get to the gatekeepers to reach them. Uh, but body language is important, and still on Zoom, you can you can pick up on some things if you have video on, and um, just trying to figure out what makes someone tick is the most important part of it all. And a lot of times that's not in the words, that's in body language. So just be aware of that. So when you get enough information collected, then you can come back and start identifying the lessons, right? Does it support? Does it refute your hypothesis? And let's look at our, our public transit example. So takeaway was the directors are currently not using software. They're concerned about fuel efficiency but they have successfully implemented some other measures. So that tells you you can go down the software route, but you make sure that you're not doing something they're already, are already trying. And once you get all of that information, you can then call it into some insights. And insights are a little different. Um, you're trying to get all of the, all of the data that you've collected out in the field and turn it into a collective value proposition, right? So all of our customers want this. So this is why we're going to build this feature. This is why we're going to this is why we're going to focus on the software aspect versus the hardware aspect because this is what the customers tell us. So 
the takeaway from this public transit example was uh, the directors would value a solution that improves fuel efficiency by X percent and would value a solution that's not capital intensive, going back to the software, moving towards EVs, only use it for five years. And they realized that a solution that reduces accidents is not of value because it is not really a problem for them. So one of the features that was being designed originally didn't test in the field because they already had taken action, use other products to cut down on safety incidents. Your cultivated insights generate your ultimate value propositions. Obviously, you need a lot of insights to get to something that you're willing to bet your company on, but um, you can get there. So when you're out in the field, there, there's, um, there's a real inclination to try and push whatever it is you have in your mind. And you have to be aware of cognitive bias. What you think is a cute baby is maybe not that in your customer's eye. And you want to get away from sales mode. And obviously, you want to get away from what what we also see quite a bit of is confirmation bias. And that's as dumb and dumber is. So you're saying there's a chance, right? Um, so really, it's just about listening, empathy. And you can really mess up, uh, mess up customer discovery by putting your own biases in the mix and going into sales mode. So some of the takeaways from just the best way to approach customer discovery, ask why, encourage stories, listen for inconsistencies. Sometimes not everyone will, will tell you the exact truth. Um, they'll sugarcoat things or try and pad things to make themselves look better. And they can ask the same question a bunch of different ways, um, though with empathy and not antagonistically, which is very much the art form of it. And then capturing your interviews is important. If you can have uh, a co-founder with you to take notes, um, or if someone will allow you to be recorded, that's usually the best way to make sure you capture everything. And use fewer words. You should be talking about 10% of the time only to ask questions and then let the let the conversation go and let the let the session take take root. And then nonverbal cues, we touched on that, you know, arms crossed or head down. And, you know, if a, if a customer discovery interview gets tricky and one of the one of the things to do is early on, say, if I ask questions that are somehow making you uncomfortable, if you want to stop the interview, um, just please pull the ripcord. No big deal. And um, that usually makes people open up much faster. And then obviously, um, yeah, don't be too much of a four-year-old here, but let silence linger. So you ask the questions, and then if there's some deep thoughts and they're thinking through, like if you ask when, when's the last time you did something, and they're going through their memories, you don't need to nudge them. So uh, sometimes silence can be uh, the gateway to an epiphany that's coming. Um, we're good on time, so I'll, I'll throw in a couple of quotes um, that I always like for customer discovery. Perfection is achieved not when there's nothing more to add, but when there's nothing left to take away. Um, and sometimes, sometimes the greatest takeaway from field work is that your customers don't need all the bells and whistles. They don't want all of the features and they don't want the premium price thing you're trying to create. Maybe it's a more simple solution. Maybe the problem is just one thing, not four or five things. And you can really focus on that one, one problem. And then you only lose what you cling to. So uh, as you go out in the field with your precious ideas, um, maybe your baby is ugly and your customers are going to tell you what, what they want. And that baby is something worth creating. So here's um, Strategizer is, uh, is a good website for a lot of this customer discovery work. And this is what we call um, a test card. And you can put in whatever information you have from your your idea, your business, and you start with, uh, we believe that, and, and you test it by, by verifying. And before you go out in the field, you wanna fill out some of these and have a couple of different test cards and what you wanna measure. And then when you come back, you want to be able to loop in some criteria and say, we were right if. So, um, we have one more 
poll, I believe, Stephen. All right. What do you do when discovery doesn't validate your hypothesis or hypotheses? All right. Let the silence linger as the results come in here. All right. Well, you all were listening. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, that the idea is you don't necessarily need to fold up shop if uh, your first hypothesis was wrong. Maybe you're you're not building what people want, and you can you can pivot. Um, sometimes lowering the price might be the trick. Maybe it's all about pricing, but usually you're you're not meeting your customers where they want to be, and pivoting is the right right thing for it. All right. Well. Um, Hey, Amy. Yeah. What are you doing on time? You have um, 11 minutes. All right. So if you would like, we can go into breakout rooms for a few minutes. Um, but I'll tell you some of the things that we do um, in class is we have open-ended conversations where it is unrelated to anything we're building. So we can test for two different things. You can test for past behavior, or you can go deeper and try and unlock deeper motivations and desires. So if you imagine, you know, for past behavior, um, if you're Uber, you would be talking about, okay, tell me the last time you got a ride from the airport, or tell me the last time you ordered food, um, tell me the last time you shared a ride with someone, and that would lead you there. Um, if you're going deeper and maybe it's a, a product that doesn't exist in the market. Um, imagine, yes, tell me about your dream car, right? Uh, does it fly? Does it run on air? Does it run on uh, candy? Who knows what? But imagine if you had had this conversation 15 years ago before the first iPhone came out uh, or 20 years and said, what would be, tell me about your dream phone? And you would say, well, not only would it be a phone, it would be able to play every song in the world, and it would be um, a great camera, but it would also be a video camera in high definition, and it would also be able to surf the internet and hold all of my files. And then Steve Jobs will go back and say, okay, we know what people want. Let's figure out how to build it, right? Um, I'll give you some uh, parting shots from just everything I tell every entrepreneur. Um, as you go out in the market, it's really about curiosity that uh, I think is the most important trait for successful entrepreneurs. And this is a grind. Um, I think more, more and more we see entrepreneurship as glamorized in the media and celebrity CEOs uh, and their rocket ships. And everyone thinks, wow, that looks really easy. Why don't we just uh, start a company and get some venture capital and then we'll get the rocket ships, right? And we all know having built businesses that that's not, that's not exactly accurate. Um, it is very much a grind and it requires not only curiosity, but some real tenacity and to do it right it also requires you to be kind and investors and entrepreneurs work together um, if you're good to the people that work with you uh, you can be successful so these are kind of my three tenets for all things entrepreneurial but it really comes down everything starts with being curious in the Ted Lasso way not judgmental so that's all I have Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, so I wanted to just emphasize some of the things. Maybe if you have a few minutes, you can comment or respond. Because I got, Absolutely. I had a chance to do, I had the opportunity to do um, be on an NIH I Corps team as the industry mentor. And I, so I was working with two scientific co founders and we did 100 interviews over Zoom. And someone asked, 
oh, I'm not going to find exactly the people. There's one, there's a question in the chat. And we, you know, we had like, we had like seven weeks to do this. And so you really just find anything adjacent. Um, and so anyone who can talk intellectually about it, because you're trying to glean things from different aspects and facets too. Um, but I remember there's two things, there's three things I think you, that I want to emphasize that you said, because I saw it in my experience. Um, one of them is, is like, how do you ask these questions? Like, can, like, if you, and so there's maybe there's segues of like, if you don't mind, can you unpack that? Or I'm going to, do you mind if I probe a little bit around that? Because you are really like, they're going to make one statement and it's not going to be enough for you. So it's like, I need to know more about that. So you have to come up with ahead of time, you, you know, just how are you going to like say that in a way that's, Hey, you know, that's, that's interesting. Let me, can I ask a little bit more about that? Well, that I still don't understand. And then what happens, you know, and then what happens? So it, you, it, but you tell them you're going to be very curious, which is one of your points. Um, I, I found that to be like people, it is an uncomfortable thing, but if you know, you're going to do it and you tell them you're going to do it and you come up with these segue phrasings that helps you um, be comfortable with it. Um, then the other two, one is, um, you mentioned this, like let, let them talk and listen to them. And I think we are, we all want to sort of get in a conversation and talk about our experience too, which you're taking up too much of the time. Nope. They don't really, they, it, it's amazing how when you ask them and they start telling your story and you're like, Hey, I have the same story. Let me tell you too. They're, you're kind of sucking the wind out of their stage. Like they want to tell their story. So you have to kind of just, I know you've done great stuff, but yet it's not about you it's about them and then the final and, the, and so the final thing was um about the, you just made this point on like the second to the last slide was we went through the whole thing and we had to meet with our we have a mentor and she asked us like what did you what did you find out and they said yeah we pretty much validated all of our assumptions and i was like no we did it we, were you not listening like in fact were the people they thought they were going to target these big metropolitan medical center universities wasn't the people who wanted it at all. It was actually rural universities and like North Dakota and Hawaii that didn't have access to what the kind of thing that they were offering. So I just wanted to like comment on the, emphasize some of the things you made, the points you made. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's really hard. Like a lot of the things we teach entrepreneurs to do is talk about themselves, tell their personal story, their why, you know, what 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 was the epiphany that led you to start this company with this amazing idea? And then customer discovery is the antithesis. Don't talk about yourself at all. In fact, don't even talk about your product or service. Let's just talk to a stranger about their issues. And it's very counterintuitive. It's very scientific. Um but it works. It absolutely works. And what we're trying to get away from you from is creating something in the lab or in your garage or in your code that you are fall in love with. Your baby is gorgeous and you just can't wait to tell everyone on social media because a million people are going to buy it on day one. And that doesn't usually happen without some research. And so there's some questions in the chat. Um, do you recommend incentivizing the interviewees? No, um, we don't, even though, um, you know, if you're meeting them for a cup of coffee or something, you can buy the coffee. But if there is even a $10 Amazon award card, reward card, you know, at the end of it, we there is there is research out there that shows any sort of incentive can tweak your research and make it faulty. And there are people who, <laughs> believe it or not, will will spend an hour with you for a ten dollar Amazon card, and then you have throwaway opinions. So you know, I can't believe every review you read online. Uh, do you recommend the LES workshop for those that are not looking for investors? Yes. Um, uh, a lot of the successful entrepreneurs that have come through the program have met co-founders. Um, some have gone on to raise many millions and hire many people but some have gone back into customer discovery to tweak their offering before launching. That's usually what happens um, quite a bit. Some, um, some of them are very successful on the face of it. And some I, I would call very successful because they did not proceed with their bad idea. They didn't give up their day job. They stayed 
working for Qualcomm or Illumina, and they realized after having the courage to talk to strangers about it, that it wasn't a viable idea they had. And so they kept their day job and didn't have to sell their house and you don't have the startup horror story. So um, it doesn't have to be just for investment. Um, virtual interviews, uh, what tool? It can be any, it can be Zoom, it can be Google, it can be uh, Skype. I think that's even still around, but um, yeah. Um, virtual interviews are are okay. And, you know, we, we really didn't think it was going to happen in 2020. We thought the whole program was going to have to shut down for a while. And like I said, we, we found that a lot of the times in um, biotech and medical devices, the decision makers in big hospitals or surgery centers, um, you could never get to unless you happen to catch them at the bar at a conference, right? A trade show in Waikiki. Um, and they were home and still working feverishly and were then all of a sudden interested in uh, how the world was changing quickly and you know answering crazy questions. So we've seen it's a good way to reach decision makers who have a lot of gatekeepers. Um, and you can also have a much faster experience. Um, sometimes you can schedule 15 minute chat with someone and if it's going really well, it'll turn into 45 minutes or an hour. Um, let's see, would you recommend conducting focus groups um, or just the interviews at first? Uh, the focus groups are, are generally, um, or a group of people being interviewed or interviewers. Usually one-on-one -on is the best place to start. Um, after you and Amy will probably nod to this, after you get past 100, you can do all kinds of fun stuff. Then you can get into focus groups and get into price sensitivity analyses. Um, you can really take the data you have and then fine tune it in different directions. But the customer discovery that's been kind of tried and true now for the last 20 years through Steve Blank's programs and through all the National Science Foundation programs is 100 one on one interviews. And then you really have good data to work off of. So she was asking about, I think she's asked, Victoria's asking about like doing a, a like a survey. I think like a questionnaire as, as opposed to a, is that what you're asking, Victoria? You can just put yes in the chat. Oh, but... yes. Yeah. Um, you can do surveys, but they don't work very well because um, you don't get any of the empathy. You don't get any of the body language. Um, there, are, <laughs> Everyone asks this question. It's like, can I just get survey monkey? Let's just do this um, 100 press, press blast. Mm -hmm. Um, and this has been studied, not by me personally, but I've read the reports coming out of NIH and it doesn't really work that well. Uh, you can have follow-ups with people um, to, after you get to know them and understand what their, their pains are and they're willing to cooperate and they're experts in the field, then you can, you know, then you can share ideas in a forum or over email usually, but one-on-one -on -one still, still the best and questionnaires and surveys don't work great. Yeah, I think they're good for like quantifying if you really want like how many people are doing something. But this sort of open ended, tell me about what keeps you up at night. It you, it's hard to get it. You can't really get that in a survey. So yeah, and and that's right for pricing. And um, you know, if you want to check in with a customer that you think might be yours and find out what they're using and how many you know how many people how many seats do they have on the software. Or how much did they spend on you know, whatever whatever program you're creating? You might be able to get um, real quick data back, but that shouldn't be the first interview. Yeah. All right, Ben. Well, thank you. We've come to the end of your presentation. Thanks for sharing the customer discovery tips and process. Uh, and if you guys, so the Lean Essential Sprint classes are going on now. They're full, but we will run one in the. I guess it's called winter, Some like in February, we usually have the next session. So um, if you stay, you know, stay tuned to our uh, email blast and we will um, promote when the next one comes out. So thank you so much for Benton for joining us tonight. Appreciate it. Stick around for the breakout rooms. Will do. Thank you. All right. So next up, we have uh, Joshua Peltz, who is the, found who is the founder of Limber. 
and he is going to sit down and have a fireside chat with Misty Rusk, our executive director of the FEI. And so while they're kind of getting themselves together, I'm going to show a, vi a video from, there's an article in the San Diego Union Tribune from August 3rd, and they put this cute little video in it. So just to sort of um, set the stage, let me see if I can share screen expand it and make everything happen all at once. Let's see. Yep. Got it. All right. So now what we're going to want to do. I think, Russ, I think it's really awesome that I get to have a 3D printed leg and I'm able to now go swimming without having to take it off. Yeah. since it is waterproof and it's easier to clean with all those ridges on it. Like, I, I feel like I can jump higher, but I didn't want to do it today because I'm just easing into it. All right, so, so Joshua Pelt and Limber won the uh, investment from the SDAC uh, 5 conference that was in May, and we are so excited to have them here. And so we've got Joshua here, and they have Misty Rusk, Executive Director of FEI. We're going to have a little fireside, ch virtual fireside chat for the next 30 minutes or so. So welcome, Misty, and welcome, Joshua. Thank you very much, Amy. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Nice to see you again. And what a great, like even that little video, like I, I don't know, for me, my bandwidth's a little low. So and with the <laughs> it maybe didn't come across quite as well. Go, go find it. It's out there. Um, but what a lovely thing to be able to say you spend your life helping people walk again. Like, how great is that? Uh, and let me tell you, as the investor and the manager of Fund Five, uh, and the person who like signed off on the on the wire transfer. That's not why we funded Joshua Peltz and his company. It was a lot of other things, but that it's that, that there's definitely a feel good component to that. Um, but that that isn't why we made the investment. We made the investment because it's a super sound business. The scalability is there. We believed in the team. You know, we looked at a whole bunch of different things. Um, and and that ended up being uh, why we made the decision to invest in Josh's company. Um, we asked Josh to be here tonight uh, to talk a little bit about the market opportunity slide and also how it fits with the storytelling. And I'm going to do an unfair thing. I'm going to I'm going to take us back to like last April, and I'm going to pull first the slides uh, that we have. Um, that were like sort of the official slides from the from the conference. And you can actually go see Josh uh, pitch this deck live at the conference. If you go on YouTube and you look up USD San Diego Angel Conference, or I think you maybe just look up San Diego Angel Conference. It's um, San Diego Angel Conference Fund 5. It's the video for, for the most recent one. And you can just fast forward until you see Josh. Um, and then you can watch him actually pitch the whole deck. It's the, it's the full 10 minutes. Uh, and it's probably one of the best things that we can give you uh, in terms of like seeing how somebody puts a real story together, right? So, you know, we say things like the great deck is 10 slides or 12 slides or, or whatever, but sometimes the slides need to wrap themselves around your storytelling. And I think Josh, we'll, we'll take a look at your slides um, here in just a second. Actually, let me just go ahead and pull them up um, because we're talking about the market opportunity slide, which is usually the second or third slide, um, but he doesn't get to it till slide 14. And I'm and I'm really, I'm at, looking at a horse historic deck. Um, Josh is gonna share his, like the deck he's working from now. Um, but I wanna share this particular slide because I think it's probably one of the best ones I've seen ever. And he, and he totally nails the song, right? So um, you all can see, it's slides, right? And I'm just going to leave them in the draft format. I'm not going to put them in the presentation. Like, I'm not trying to present Josh's slides. I'm telling you as an investor, 
this is a cool slide because of a couple of things. One, everything is in dollars, right? As an investor, I can translate this to a whole bunch of other things because I can understand, I, I don't have to know how something's priced or what a person means or what a user means or what a product means. Uh, I, it's all been translated for me. So he's made it easy. And of course the market is a big market. Um, but what we, what I really want to focus in tonight on is, is just um, this, this piece here, his Psalm, which he says is 87 million. And this is where we see a lot of early stage companies really mess this up because you say, well, we looked at, and there's like, you know, 4 million users and each user pays $80. And if we just get 2% of, that's not what investors are looking for because that doesn't help us understand how you're gonna push your company forward and really move it. So this this is beautiful because he says, SOM is, so a, a good SOM is time bound, geographically specific and, um, and, and segment, right? So he's saying his sum is their five-year North American below knee prosthetic market penetration, right? He's talking about one very specific piece that's in a specific area and over a specific amount of time. And then usually what we see is somewhere later in the um, in a in a good deck. Uh, we see this number again, the sum, and a good deck, we see it again on forecast. And so forecast can be anywhere in the deck, but we usually see it later, closer to the ask or with the traction or something like that. But this is just a couple of slides away. Uh, and so I'm just flipping to that. Did you guys all follow me to his financial projection slide? Okay. So here you see this again. He pitched the, as this to us in March, April, um, 2023. So five years out, revenue for 2028. There's that 87 million. But then he tells us what it means. 61,239 units, right? We know those are below knee prosthetics, sold through 480 clinics by 10 sales reps. And do you see as how that just tells me this story about like, I know a whole lot more about you know, how he plans to get to those customers and convert those customers. And, and he spends the rest of the deck like really walking us into that story and makes it um, believable. Like we, we, we can believe that he can get to this number because he's got a path to do it over the next five years. All right, so, so, so Josh, with all of that in mind, let me stop sharing. I just, I wanted to first provide that as framework for everyone. Um, and Josh, I think it would be great if you can go ahead and share, you, you don't have to share, like, obviously this is old. I'm sure this has changed. Um, or maybe it hasn't, that's interesting too. Uh, but if you want to walk us through how you came to your market opportunity, what you were thinking, how you built this out, like some of the, um, what happened behind the scenes for, for your company as you guys were working to put this together. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Misty. So you can see visually it is similar. One key difference, we changed from 2028 to actually 2027 uh, because we are planning to actually hit the market at the end of 23. Uh, 27 ended up being our fifth year. So it went from, you know, closer to 90 down to 60 it's a it's a year further you know closer so actually that projection would be similar in 28 but um that was to take one year off that but to talk a little bit about how we got to this market opportunity um this definitely had a number of iterations we started at first only looking at prosthetics that ended up being you know a smaller segment and when we really looked at the core competency, we realized that the technology that we've developed also could play a part in the orthotic segment. So in order to get away from any worries about a potential small market problem, we went for a global prosthetic and orthotic market. And that was based on a balancing of what we thought our core technology could realistically extend into um, with, with 
with kind of needing to have certain totals. So in order to get these numbers, um, we use a number of a number of things. So number one was industry reports. Um, there's industry reports that are compiled uh, that you can find this data in. Number two is publications. So published literature around this. And, and then number three was foundations or coalitions or groups. So for example, for us, the amputee coalition has a lot of statistics that you can draw from. One of the interesting things about these market numbers is that each of these numbers can be calculated in 10 different ways. So there is no perfect number for TAM. There is no perfect way to calculate it. And the bottom line is that you need to draw from multiple sources and have a realistic set of assumptions that you used when you're calculating this. So that was to get the total addressable market segment. Now, if we look at the serviceable addressable market segment, um, we focused on just the lower limb prosthetic market globally, which is really a direct, uh, that we can directly hit with our core intellectual property, with our core product, but also having a technology that is globally scalable. So while this isn't in our business model in the first few years, this is definitely somewhere we can get with our technology. And so that, again, we had a, a set of assumptions on, on how we got to these numbers, and that was pulled out of industry reports, publications, and various statistical databases. And then the last one is the SOM. Now, SOM's interesting because when we started off, we actually used the total North America baloney prosthetic market. So we had a number that was you know, eight, eight or so times this number. Um, but it turns out that the majority of uh, investors, and I think the Brink also teaches this, that the SOM should actually be the segment that you're planning on capturing so that it ties in with your forecast. So what we ended up doing is we looked at what is that total baloney prosthetic market in North America, and then we also tied that with our forecast, connected that with our forecast for the year 2027. And that's how we get to this number. And then that ties nicely into the story where we talk about, you know, this is what we're looking to obtain. This is the market penetration. And then this is how we're going to get there, looking at the go-to-market strategy, the business model. And then that all ties together into your financial forecast, financial projections. Um, a couple... Uh, thoughts or, or tips that I that I came up with is you always want to, as you're going through this exercise, building this into your financial projections, you always want to check yourself. So if you go through this calculation and you end up with 90% market penetration in your fifth year, that's probably not realistic. If you end up with a value that's bigger in your SOM than your SAM, that's probably not realistic. So it's always good we calculated this three different ways and we ended up taking average values. And that was just a way to be confident in these because you want to make sure that you're not overselling and under delivering. You want to make sure that you have reasonable numbers that can get the investor excited, but can also be supported with a reasonable a business model and a reasonable trajectory. Um, you can also, of course, use the market opportunity to steer some of the business. So definitely the process of doing the research um, on our, you know, market sizes, market segments. Hi. Okay, I'm for some whether that is whether that is globally, um, whether that's location basis or product type basis or market segment, that's a great way to fine tune your business model and your business plan. So when we were looking at our go-to-market strategy, we were actually even breaking down the North American market state by state. Now you don't have to get that granular in your market opportunity slide. You wanna keep that high level. But again, these are all tools that you can use because the market opportunity, the financial projections and your business model all have to tie together with a reasonable set of assumptions. So. This slide seems simple, but there's definitely a lot that kind of goes into it. Um, and you you can definitely get in trouble if you just 
put some numbers up here that you can't really explain because that will, of course, raise a red flag for um, the individual or group that you're going to pitch this to. So you definitely need to have a solid basis for why you think these numbers are reasonable. Because at the end of the day, it's all a best guess. It's, it's based on statistics and numbers and calculations, but there's a lot of different ways to do this. And you can easily have a vastly different set of numbers based on how you do these calculations. Um, Thank you for that. Let's open it for questions. If anybody has questions on this part, because I think this is really the crux of what we wanted to share. And I, and I would rather go to your questions than, uh, than go on and like dig a little deeper into this. Thank you, Joshua. You could use your virtual raise your hand and then it queues you up at the top as well. Let's do that. Uh, let's go to Melissa. Hi. Um, uh, I appreciate you sharing this with us, Josh. I noticed at the bottom of this slide you have precedence research and Grandview research. Are those reports that you found? Um, yes. Or can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> I come from academia. And there you always slap a, a hundred citations that can end up really getting way too messy. So these are simply two larger industry reports that we use in finding the various numbers. And, and you need a lot, actually, more than you think. You know, we had to find a number for Europe and then we had to find a number for North America. And so these were two reports we used. We also used a number of publications and other statistical databases. But that's we wanted to, you know back up the data a little bit by giving two reports. Can I follow up on, sure. do I get a follow-up question? You can. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so I've noticed that when I get some research, um, I, I keep finding reports that have numbers redacted. So they're like, uh, so it'll say, oh, the your industry has got a CAGR of significantly increasing to such and such amount, but the numbers will be blanked out. And then it wants you to buy the reports for like $40,000 or $20,000. And I can't find a single one in, in my particular field that doesn't have the numbers redacted. So yeah. a couple of resources for you, Melissa. Um, one, if you are a Brink client, uh, we have a centralized clearinghouse in Texas and they buy a ton of reports. They may not buy everything, um, but they, they, buy a, uh, they buy a lot of stuff. Um, because it's centralized for the for the whole country for the SBDC system. If there's a, a really specific report that you're trying to get, we can ask. Okay. Uh, and the way that you do that, you've got to that's got to filter through your whoever your assigned consultant is, and they may not know how to use it. They may they may not know how to access that. So if if you say, hey, Misty, set just copy me on it, and if there's if if your consultant struggles, I'll help. Um, I'll help whoever is working with you and also Amy to get that sorted out because that's a, a, a really underutilized resource that we have access to. Um, also, USD has a business librarian that's assigned to us. We can ask her. Her name's Jennifer Bidwelsh. We can ask her to give us a hand with that. Um, UCSD also has an uh, open to the public. Their, their library has an open to the public component, and you can go in and ask their researchers to help you find some of these things. And, the, and, um, and then online resource, I haven't checked this one, I should go look because I say it often enough. Uh, New York City Library has an online uh, portal that you can access a bunch of things. They have a whole business section for that. So, and that's really for, for everybody. Uh, but those are like some, some additional resources we can, you know, we can put your, put your direction. And, and, and Missy, I was just going to uh, just to interject uh, really quickly uh, here. Uh, when I go over calculating the market potential uh, uh, here in just a little bit, I'll give I'll give you guys some other resources that you uh, that you can use and some links that you can use to get to those two when you go over that. So perfect. Thank you all very much. Great. Yeah. Um, Abraham. And um, nice to see you, Joshua. Again, we met in UCSD. Uh, actually, it's a very nice way that you if you don't mind mention the sam one more time from the point of market segment because i want to know is this sam market segment is little larger or bigger than the market segment you used for the sum 
So if you can go through that or expand on that, thank you. Yes. So my understanding, and again, um, I don't teach this market analysis, but my understanding is that the obtainable market segment really is going to have a direct tie to your business model and your financial projections. And in that sense, it should directly show up in, you know, anything that you want to include in your SOM, you know, should be products that are on your product roadmap in the next few years, all of that. Whereas SAM for us could be addressed with our products, but maybe not addressed with our current business model, at least in the next few years. And so the way that we differentiated between SAM and SOM is that we actually don't have a, a, a perfect roadmap already figured out for how to target global markets. We know that our technology has the potential, but we have not yet built that business model to tackle those global markets. So that was in our SAM, because while we can address it with our technology, without a need for a massive technological advancement, it's not in our current model and it's not um, showing up immediately in our financial projections. That not not from geographical point of view, but more from the point of the, you said, uh, lower limb versus below knee. So from the, that point. Sure. So so again, um, our first technology is lower limb, but we segmented it one step further, which is below knee. There are also above knee prosthetic limbs. So the global, right, is larger and the fact that we're including also above knee. So that's that's why we did that. And it would just because while the core technology works for it, it would be one product step further. Um, we're going to go to Jordan. Hey there. Um, my question is um, what you were saying about the SOM being that it's not realistic for you to actually penetrate 90% of the, of the SOM. Um, how did you determine what percentage of the SOM your business model it would realistically address? That's a great question. And I'm going to be totally honest. One of the first ways we built out our financial projections was talking with advisors that were familiar with ONP and specifically the medical device industry in the US market and saying, hey, what are realistic penetration targets? And we actually built a top-down model, which is not recommended. We have now, and this is months and months ago, actually, this was, we did this pivot sort of in the middle of the SDAC process. We then went and we said, okay, well, that's really not how you should build your business model. We then did a bottom-up approach where we looked at if we bring a salesperson on, if we have the production capacity, you know, if we're targeting certain areas in the US or certain markets, what's our penetration look like based on that? And, and building it bottom up so we know when to hire the correct person. So, but in the first iteration, sometimes it's helpful just to give yourself a sanity check on, you know, if we want to have a revenue of this, what's the market penetration? And that'll help you get your hands around numbers. But it is, of course, better to build more realistically how a business works. A business doesn't work by saying, I want this and I'm going to just take a penetration. It works by building up personnel, production capacity, all of that. And so I think, you know, you can tackle it in both ways. We started that way and then we shifted towards a more realistic way of, of creating a, a financial projection. Cool. Thank you. It looks like Tanya also put in the chat that um, she might cover that in a bit. So thank you for going over. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank um, you. Josh, we just have a couple of minutes left. And since you're, you know, you've recently been through this experience and you've, you know, you've gone on and raised with some other groups. Do you have advice for, do you, do you have input that you want to give this group? Like uh, SDAC's due diligence process is difficult and the questions are arduous and many like do you have do you have anything that you want to lay out for people things you wish somebody would have told you this time last year sure um number one i think that while not everybody is local to southern california obviously that that helps because it's easier to go to the in-person events i would strongly urge you a big part of being successful 
is you have to get to know the group or the fund or the individuals that you want to work with. Because one of the biggest things that you are invested in as an early startup without much traction or revenue is your team. And so I think that throughout the SDAC process, and now, you know, it was easy for me because I'm local, but I went to every single event in person that I could. And that really allowed me to build personal connections and get the most out of the process. And I think that's one of the reasons that we were successful. Um, so I would definitely, um, you know, as much as you can uh, try to network, whether it's in person or it has to be virtual, but make sure you're spending the time to network and get everything out of the process that you can, because it's truly an opportunity to improve as a startup for the angel investor to improve and then to build a really robust network. So um, we feel fortunate that we were able to be in person and, and make those connections. All right, very good. Um, I know you're super busy. And so thanks so much for taking time out to be here with us tonight. We, we appreciate you so much. And um, we're, you know, one of the things you end up with if you win the San Diego Angel Conference is you end up with like 75 cheerleaders behind you. So we're, we're just all very excited. Uh, about your progress and everything that you're doing. So thanks for being here. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand it back to Amy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Josh. Good to see you again. And thank you, Misty. And so we have a um, like a five minute break, five minute break. And then um, we're going to bring on Tanya Hertz. And she's going to really go in and explain how you come up with those market opportunity numbers. And uh, so five minutes, we'll see you in five minutes. Good.
Hey everybody, it's 7.05 and we are going to get right back to it. So we have tonight with us uh, Professor Tanya, Tanya Hertz um, from the Rec Lab um, over at San Diego Miramar College. Uh, and she also uh, teaches at San Diego State. Um, and she, she and I have worked together on a, a ton of stuff. We've judged a lot of things and we've worked together on some stuff. And every time I hear her speak or I run into her in the street like I did yesterday, I just think, man, this is somebody I want to do more work with. So it's lovely that she's here tonight to walk us through market potential and really uh, build in some more resources for her. And with that, um, Tanya, I'm going to turn it right over to you. Well, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> the feeling is mutual, Misty. Uh, I love, love working together, and I'm sure we're going to get lots more opportunities moving forward to work together. So welcome, everybody. Tonight, we are going to uh, we're going to dive a little deeper into um, into estimating, calculating market potential, uh, calculating that Tam Sam song, achieving product market fit. This is not um, this is not something that's that's uh, easy. It's not something that there's a, a clear right and wrong answer uh, to. And so that's what makes it uh, so very difficult. Uh, like Josh was uh, explaining in, in, his, uh, in his presentation, our, our market uh, potential, it's based on, on estimations. It's based on um, assumptions. It's, it's not, uh, you know, we don't know for sure in a lot of, uh, a lot of times. And so we have to make sure that the assumptions we make, the estimations that we're providing to investors are realistic, that they're well supported, that they are uh, assumptions that 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 the investor can can get behind and, and can feel safe that their uh, that their money is is safe uh, based on your ability uh, to estimate well. So uh, there are um, a lot of benefits to estimating the market potential. This is this is your opportunity to quantify that business opportunity and to and to really make sure that you um, know the value and viability of your your business idea. Good market uh, estimations add credibility to your pitch. They are um, it's a way to evaluate your business model, and we'll, we'll look at we'll look at. Um, these estimations in terms of the business model uh, quite a bit as we move forward. Make sure always realistic and well-supported estimates. Uh, just like uh, just like the basics of business communication, every assertion that you make in entrepreneurship needs to be supported with evidence. It needs to be supported with uh, evidence that's um, evidence that 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 carries weight, right? Uh, solid evidence. And the evidence doesn't necessarily need to be uh, academic research. It can be primary research. We, we know that in entrepreneurship, it's important to get out of the building, to talk to people. That's all research. That's all evidence. All of this customer discovery that, that you're doing um, is, used, uh, is used to estimate your market potential and um, and to give credibility to what you're saying. So everything that comes out of your mouth needs to be supported, needs to be supported, needs to be validated with evidence. So uh, we do this uh, by sharing Tam Sam Som. And the easiest uh, to estimate of all of the of all of the uh, Tam Sam and Som is Tam. So Tam, you, you you'll see it. Total available market, total addressable market. I'm okay with the, some of the some of the different ways that this is uh, that this is shared, but uh, I'll go with total addressable market. So this is the maximum market um, market size or revenue of a business uh, idea or revenue that a business idea can generate by selling a service or product, calculated in annual revenue if a hundred percent of the available market were achieved. So this is. If everybody uh, everybody bought your particular product or service, uh, this is basically the industry. This is essentially the industry. This is the easiest to uh, to estimate because you can simply Google the industry. Um, so it's a sum of all the revenue streams for all customer uh, segments for all business model canvases. If you want to look at it in terms of business model canvases, every single person in that um, industry. That's that's your TAM. Very easy to find online, right? We just look up, blah, blah. we just look up. 
go back there, look up a, a particular uh, industry. Now, when you're expressing or when you're sharing your market potential, when you're talking about your market potential on uh, in your pitch deck, it can be expressed as um, either as solely as annual revenue, or it can be um, market size and annual revenue. So I see a hand uh, here. Do we have a, a question from uh, Jordan? Yeah, just really quick. Uh, when you say the essentially the industry, if you know, I think a lot of people's businesses might straddle numerous uh, industries or you're, like, you're kind of in this industry, you're kind of in it, like, you know, for my, like at the coffee industry, but also the adaptogen industry, like there's a few different things. What industry exactly would you be um, uh, aiming towards? So the way that I look at, at, at um, Tam Tam Som is um, I almost look at it like a resume, like, you, you know, in that, I mean, uh, you're, you're the spin doctor, right? You're the one who gets to decide what you're sharing about your startup. And so um, it's important to have realistic projections and to and to know uh, where where you stand in different industries. But but if there's a particular industry that makes you look better, that might be the one to to to, to share. And uh, I don't know. I hate to say it that way, but 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 really, Understood. yeah. You know what I mean? You're the one who gets to tell what you want to tell about your particular business. Now that's that doesn't mean uh, you shouldn't know. Um, <laughs> you know, you shouldn't know where you stand in, in, in each particular industry. Um, I, I will say this too. You need to be careful about, about the uh, estimates that you make being too large or being too small. Generally, generally speaking, investors like to see a large TAM. Now that large uh, TAM though needs to be tempered with, uh, with a very, very realistic SAM and a very realistic SOM. Uh, so, so, I mean, like many things in entrepreneurship, it's sort of case by case uh, basis, I would say. Um, yeah, no, no clear answers in these. Um, okay, so one thing I will say with the um, with your projections, you want to be finding the evidence that you're finding from um, in, from from websites, from from academic um, you know academic research, from from. Uh, various, uh, you know, various uh, different uh, sources that have credibility, right? And so you're going to want to pick uh, credible sources. Uh, it doesn't have to be academic, but it has to be credible, right? So I um, I was really glad that Josh shared shared some of the different, um, some of the different places that he went to, to get uh, information for his uh, Tam Sam Som. These are some um, places that I use uh, to get uh, evidence, uh, statista.com, it's great for market size, for industry data, when you're calculating your Tam Tam Som. The Global Entrepreneurship Mar uh, Monitor at Babson College is really good for emergent industries, so nascent industries, industries that are uh, you know up and coming for global markets, obviously. Um, academic research centers are excellent for um, for all types of all types of data. And uh, the nice thing about a lot of a academic and, and public um, research uh, sources is that you don't have to pay, right? You don't have to pay $40,000 to get access to that particular um, paper. Now, uh, most colleges and universities have paid subscriptions to various, uh, you know, research uh, papers or uh, research uh, publications, including Miramar College, the entire San Diego Community College District. Um, I know for sure UCSD uh, does. Um, there are uh, you can you can get a lot of information. Kaufman Foundation has great uh, great uh, data there. Um, like uh, Missy was saying, the New York Public Library has a business resource section that has just so much data, and it's free, and you can access uh, access it there. Um, obviously, you can go through the Census Bureau. Uh, if you uh, one thing that I, I I like to do, and I I uh, um, a resource that I like to use that that I feel like is a little bit antiquated and some people maybe don't take full advantage of our librarians. Librarians are amazing. I just, I, I love talking to librarians. I love getting help from librarians. They are smart and they are so willing to help you with whatever um, you need, especially librarians at academic uh, institutions. You know, just go to, go to your local college and just ask the librarian uh, to help you. Um, a lot of community colleges like here at Miramar uh, College at the REC, um, you know, these are open to everybody, to all of us. You don't need to be, um, you know, you don't need to to be 
any particular anything to be a student at a community college. It's open for all of us. So take advantage of that. Um, you know, sign up for you know, sign up for a class at community college and use the heck out of those resources. Right. Okay. Moving on. Um, so easiest, 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 easiest is is Tam. Hardest is uh, Sam, and most difficult is Sam, I would say. So Sam is a uh, serviceable, served, addressable market. Um, so it's it's essentially your market segment within the TAM, which can be targeted by your products or services within your geographical reach, within a reasonable amount of time. Um, and and it's and it's the the products that can be targeted or, or that you can reach, that you can potentially reach this particular market. So it's the entire uh, market but it is segmented, right? It's segmented, essentially. Uh, segmented in terms of time, geography, and um, it, just uh, essentially segmented, right? So uh, it, you can define SAM as the total sales volume of a particular product or service that can be sold by all of the vendors in the market within a specific territory that your company can service. It's the portion of TAM that you will target. Um, it's a little, it, it, I, I should say this, uh, but but it's not the same thing as your target market or your initial target market, your early adopters, your beachhead market. And I'll show you in a little bit uh, the difference there. Um, but just like, uh, just like TAM, SAM can be expressed as market size and annual revenue or just annual revenue, depending on what you're trying to share, what you're trying to, yeah. what makes you look good, right? Uh, this is your sanity check against TAM. So uh, as an investor, when I see somebody with uh, a very large TAM, that's a good thing. But then if their uh, SAM is also unrealistically large, that's that's troubling unless it's uh, well supported, especially if the SOM is also uh, very large. So um you need to convince people. Basically, you need to convince people with your number. So uh, Tam and Sam, they're both addressable. They're both uh, considered addressable. And what do we mean by addressable market? Addressable marketing, it's a concept in marketing that refers to specific groups of people who you can address to get them interested in your product or service and who could potentially become your future, um, your, your future customers. So, um, so uh, when we're, uh, when we're, Looking at Sam, this is the share of revenues that can be attained in a given period of time. And I say this because um, there's no hard and fast rule. And this is one of those things that, that often people come to me or are confused about. Uh, should I should I calculate Sam for a year? Should I calculate Sam for five years? And um, the answer is, well, maybe, right? Uh, it should be somewhere in that period of time. It should be somewhere in that period of time that that... Uh, makes sense, but it should be time bound. It definitely should be time bound. It should also be uh, uh, geographically bound. So, for example, maybe maybe your TAM is the I don't know, uh, like like the travel industry, right? The entire travel industry, uh, and that's easy to find. Go on Google, type in uh, what's the size of the travel industry. Is it growing? Is it is it um, getting smaller, uh, et cetera, et cetera? Easy to find. Um, Sam would be um, much more specific. So, so maybe, sorry, my lights just went off in here. Um, Sam might be something like um, uh, uh, online travel industry uh, in the United States or uh, um, within, uh, you know, in the last uh, in the last uh, five year period, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. All right, let me let's see. Let me get these lights to come back on. Sorry, I don't know. Thinks that I'm not in here. Sorry about that. Okay, so they're on a timer, and I guess they shut off. Uh, um, actually, while I was doing that, let me let me uh, maybe uh, pause here for just a second because I'm sure uh, that there's some questions. Uh, do we have any questions right now before before I move on? Okay. So Sam is the proportion of uh, the total addressable market that. You said something about revenue within a one to five year period of time, but that's not specifically for your company because you're not going to address the entire SAM. There's no so way. You to, just, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. A, can you just yeah, clarify yeah. that really quick? Absolutely. So this is a uh, yeah. That's that's a great point. This is it. Uh, this is all the companies. This is all, all of the companies because there's no way that you could address that entire entire market. This is a hundred percent 
of that market, but it's not the entire industry. It's 100% of that entire uh, market that has been segmented, that has been segmented uh, to match your particular um your particular customer discovery, your customers, who your customers actually are, if that makes sense, right? Um, so, so if you were to estimate the entire population of your customer seg of your customer segments, which your value propositions apply, so all the people to uh, to which the value proposition apply, and total up what they are, um, and then multiply that by the revenue that you could expect, that's your SAM. That's your SAM. In reality, could you capture 100% of that uh, SAM? I've had people say yes, no. There's uh, unless there's a monopoly and um, you know a clear definitive monopoly, that's not going to happen, right? Uh, now this can get this can get ex extremely complicated, right? This is a complicated uh, process because you know the 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 um, TAM was a pretty simple uh, top down. Um, this is not is as easy. It can it can be complicated when you, especially when you take the bottom up approach, which most of us uh, would take. So when you're um, so you you have the um, you know the total number of people in that particular segment, and you're supposed to multiply that by the revenue that you could expect. Well, how do you calculate that revenue that you could expect? Well, you need to know you need to know some things about uh, price, right? Profit margins, competition. It can get really complicated and you need to be careful not to get not to get too deep into the weeds um, when you're when you're doing your calculations. And this is I think why so many people have such a difficult time calculating Tam Sam Son. Um it, it, you know, if you're um just just going to price. If you're trying to calculate the revenue, you're trying to say, okay, how much could um, you know could a company, any company, make in a, a five year period in this particular um, you know industry, right? In this particular region, um, well, you you need to multiply by how much <laughs> how much um, money they would make. So so maybe you might want to look at things like price. Well, when you get into price, there's lots of different ways you can calculate price. If you know anything about pricing, you know there's cost based pricing, there's competition based pricing, there's value based pricing, and um, and and most of you have not gotten to the point where you are uh, where you're ready to actually um, make some some clear definitive decisions about price. It's too early. It's too early uh, for you to to be doing some detailed uh, you know value based uh, pr pricing models. And so uh, the reason I say this is because perfection is the enemy of progress in entrepreneurship. Do not get so bogged down in doing everything so perfectly that you do nothing, okay? Um, it's okay. It's absolutely okay at this point it, when you're when you're using when you're you know calculating your uh, market potential to use um, just simple competition based pricing um, or or uh, simple you know look up look up what the revenue was in, in a particular industry in a particular region if you can find it and and use that um it's it's good enough it's good enough uh, remember you're you know you don't have necessarily all of the data you shouldn't have all of the data yet but but and you don't need all of the answers you just need to know uh why you came up with what you came up with. You need to know, you need to be able to, um, you, need, you need to be able to, to convince people that, um, including yourself, that that uh, the estimates that you make uh, have value, right? And they're based on realistic assumptions. You don't need every little detail. And so I should even get off of the slide because you don't need to get into that that much of a detail. You don't need to show everything, but you need to know everything. So you need to know everything about that particular industry. Is um, what I mean. Um, you you need to you need to be able to answer uh, questions that they as they come up, but but don't don't get too, um, I don't know, just don't get too bogged down. I see it happen all the time. And um, yeah, it, 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 you know, yeah, that's all I need to say about that. Okay. So, um, so uh, we, we said TAM is different than, than um, SAM in that it is segmented um, and, and it is segment segmented based on what you learned in your customer, customer discovery to a large part. Um, it's the um, entire population of your um, your customer segments uh, multiplied by the revenue that you could expect, but it's not your beachhead. It's not your initial target market. It's not your early adopters. Uh, it's 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 larger than that, um, and and it's different than that in that 
um, when you're calculating th things like your beachhead or your initial uh, uh, target market, that's really, um, that's a very, very, very specific niche market uh, of who are going to be the very first ones to try out your um, your product or service. It used to be something that we used to share. I don't know if those of you who've been in entrepreneurship for a really long time, but we used to share this in our pitch decks for a long time. We would... Um, you know, sh share that target market. And I, I still think it's extremely important to, uh, to calculate it and to know it, know who those um, initial buyers are. Um, but you don't necessarily need to sh share it in your uh, pitch deck. You need to know it though. When, when they have questions about it, you need to know who those early, early adopters are. And I put the link to this, um, to these slides in the chat. So if you want to come back into this and, and look at, um, look at any of the uh, you know the information that I'm sharing with you you're more than welcome to and later on like at the end of the presentation I tacked on how to calculate everything <laughs> you know your your beachhead your everything okay so now let's get to the final one uh Sam, your share of market so um share of market Sam is share of market I feel like it's, it's Tam Sam Sam I feel like it's been a bad game of telephone for too many years and and it's they've all morphed into different meetings but uh but but Sam is is straightforward uh, share of market it's the um the estimate of the of the market size that you can realistically expect to capture with your startup so if um you know if, if Tam is 100% Sam is what percentage? It's a percentage. What percentage? And what do you think is a reasonable percentage of uh, a market that you, as a startup market, could expect to achieve? Uh, this is this is always a question that I get a, a lot. And and I every every time I see uh, pitch presentations, I've judged many pitch pitch competitions. Uh, there's always somebody in there who has a, a sum of fifty percent, seventy five percent, twenty five percent. Um, now, is that a realistic sum? What do you guys think? Would would a fifty percent be a realistic sum? No, probably not. Right? Probably not. Uh, I I I would be hard pressed to find a business where you could capture fifty percent market share. I mean, just think about any industry. Think about like the ride sharing industry. If you came up with a new ride sharing service, do you think that by year five you could capture fifty percent of of Uber, well, of Uber and Lyft and all of the other um, all of the other people in the market, right? So how do you, you know, what is a realistic expectation? How much market share could you realistically capture? Um, it's it's not as it's not as as simple as just pulling a number out of the air. Uh, I highly recommend that when you're calculating your SOM, um, that you, like everything else, use evidence. Look and see what the what what the segmentation of the of the market looks like right now. So, like if it's ride sharing, if you're since we're on that ride sharing industry, um, look and see uh, the the top top ten ride sharing apps. What what percentage of the market uh, do they own? Do they do they have? Right? Maybe you know. Maybe it's only ten percent, or uh, it's probably more than that with them. It's probably I don't know fifty percent. But but it, it's uh, it could be uh, significantly lower than you think. Look it up. Look it up. Look it up. Look and see. Um, and then look and see what some of the other uh, other uh, companies that that entered the market. What did they do after year two? What did they do after year three? Now, obviously you're entering at a different time. It's a, it's going to be a different, um, you know, product life cycle. It's, it's going to be different, but it doesn't have to be exact. You just have to have evidence. You have to have, uh, I mean, there has to be rationale behind whatever number that you're, uh, hi, Danny. Um, did you have a question? Yes, Tanya. Thank you for taking my question. Um, so I was wondering, I, I do really well with examples. I'm not sure if now, or maybe you can email it to the group afterwards. If you can give like, you know, a handful of real world examples, like what Uber did or Airbnb or other startups, DoorDash, et cetera. Uh, I think I recall, I think Airbnb was like, you know, there's like every hotel in the world or something. I, I, I can't remember which, which company did that, but I remember some of them had some pretty big uh, assumptions, you know? So um, yeah, I was wondering if maybe uh, currently you have examples you can run through, or if not, maybe uh, can you email me at, email the group. So are you looking? Are you looking for examples from their from their initial pitch decks, or are you yeah. looking from the reality for for the reality of what they captured? Initial pitch decks because I worked for YC, right? So um, and I know this was iterative for Uber and others, 
Yeah, so, yeah. Alex, if, if I don't want to put you on the spot to, to recall uh, real life examples, but if you don't have it now, then uh, as if you could email it to the group afterwards. Yeah, great. I, I'd be happy to, to share some with you. With you, but I tell you, I tell you what. Um, th there have been uh, when you the, the difference between uh, what what companies have done in their in their pitch presentations versus reality um, sometimes is very stark. Is very stark. We have a hard time estimating um, realistically, and 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 it doesn't necessarily mean it's a horrible thing, but but investors do care that you have the ability to uh to, to make realistic assumptions and um you know nobody's going to be happy seeing a 25 percent uh psalm right no nobody's gonna be happy uh unless you have some amazing evidence to, to back that up yeah i don't i can't think of any like off the top of my head but i'll, I'll send them to you danny i'll send them to you um yeah did, any other questions before we we move move on on this one did anybody, maybe, uh, I don't know how we are on time. I'm so bad with time, but um, did, did anybody, anybody who's uh, maybe just recently calculated a, a SOM, um, I'd, I'd love to hear what you what you calculated your share of market to be and how you came up with that number. It was really interesting uh, when Joshua shared how he ca came up with his. That was a great way. You know, ask others in the industry. What, what's a, a normal, what's a normal market share to capture, right, in this particular industry? That's, yeah, hey, direct from the from the horse's mouth anybody else have any uh examples yeah i see um is it Abraham? Abraham. Yes. yeah so um we are working in heart failure management uh -huh. and i i assume for for the sam to be the the total market of the countries that we want to uh, be involved in let's say maybe maybe US and other one other countries or something like that. But for the right. SOM, we find out that if we know what are the states that we are going to try to penetrate in five years mm -hmm. and what percentage of those states for heart failure management, we can, uh, we can be part of it for, for the remote patient monitoring and AI analysis of their, those data. So, and then, so, and, so without, are you talking about, are you saying without looking at, at what the competitors are just saying, like, a, like, look, like without looking at what share of the market competitors had you, is that what you're saying? So I think for the sum, um, I don't know how we can bring the competitors to the sum, because I thought we are talking about the, 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 um, geographical region that you want to enter share of market. So and, share of market. So so SOM yeah. is share of market. It's a percentage of the market share that your company will capture in a given period of time. So so you have it all. You have it all uh, segmented geographically, demographically, uh, time, etc. Uh, when you get to the SOM, that's what percentage share of market do you expect to be able to capture in that time period? So let's say we say five or ten percent, but you 10%, said ten. But but then where is that ten percent coming from? It needs to come from some. It, you can't just let's say ten percent. It needs to come from something. So that's when you need to start looking things up. So based know? based on the number of cardiologists and number of hospitals that we will trying to share or we can read. Not a good way. Not a good way. I, I wouldn't recommend go, going that route. I would I would instead look and see what something some uh, a similar similar organizations or in similar uh, fields or similar industries. What were they able to capture in their uh, in their first so many years or something like this? I, I think you'll get a lot better number that has a little bit more weight. And Garrett, I see that you have a, a question as well. Thank, thank you. Yeah, of course. Of course. So I'm actually in a similar industry than him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we I think we've talked before, uh, Ibrahim. We have to we have to talk again, but we've done a little bit of research on it, and so I mean, at least like we've kind of niched down into cardiac rehab. Mm -hmm. um, but from my research and our research, there's a hundred. Uh, I'm sorry, a million, one point three million people that are eligible for cardiac rehab, and then of those one point three million people, only thirty seven percent of them. Um, are actually able to be served by the current supply, like the, the current cardiac rehab facilities and the current cardiac rehab offerings that are currently available. So would that mean that we can get the other 63%? Uh, I, 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 I doubt it, but I don't know. I don't know. So uh, I, I think more... 
more likely so that seems like a, you'd have to really get into the specifics but you'd have to find out like why could they you know why could only 37 percent serve that particular market i mean i don't i don't think that just because the others couldn't serve it doesn't necessarily mean that you could serve them um so I, I think I think you're going to have to get into specifics there. But in general, I would say in general, I would say that um, you, you know, what, what you want to sorry, what you want to, to look at is not necessarily not necessarily like what you uh, what you hope to do or or, uh, you know, even even. Uh, even what you expect to do what what's better what's better for evidence is always what happened before what what evidence do we have of, of something similar and uh, of something similar happening and how then uh, you know how then are you like that I, I don't know if i'm describing i'm maybe not explaining it very well but you but, think you think it would be better to do more like a competitive analysis of, of the rest of the market rather than just taking um mm -hmm. The, the market research in general from like a you know like a medical database or something like that i i think it would it would carry a lot more weight i think it would uh, you know it seems okay. a, a lot to, to me yeah. um, maybe in that particular industry maybe i'm wrong but anyways okay so uh when we're sharing this uh, data when we're sharing this data how do we share it how do we how do we uh get our information across uh like everything in business and entrepreneurship, quickly, clearly, concisely, right? Use um, use estimates uh, and 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 make those um, make those projections. You, you know your projections, your guesses as um, clear and concise as possible. So uh, when you're when you're calculating your TAM SAM SOM, there's a lot of numbers. There's a lot of words. Remember, people can only people uh, can only listen or read. They can't do both at the same time. Less is always more when it comes to uh, pitch deck presentations, when it comes to uh, market projection slides, you want everything as abbreviated as, as possible. Um, you can share um, like uh, this, this slide that I'm showing has, um, you know, it's the same data as the slide uh, before, but it, it's abbreviated. If you can even um, abbreviate it further, better, right? Remember that Remember, people can only read or um, listen. They can't do both at the same time. Don't give them too many things to look at. Don't give them too many things to read. Just keep it as simple as possible. Um, oh gosh, I keep not knocking that over. Uh, uh, you know, if if you can, just get away with with the revenue um, and nothing else. Uh, do that, right? Um, just keep it clear, concise, simple. People will ask you if they want more information, and um, you don't need to show everything. You just need to know everything. Um, and then, especially whenever you're talking about numbers and pre financial projections, keep keep things as simple, clean as possible. Um, numbers are boring <laughs> for the most part. So pull out the numbers that help you to tell the story. Leave the rest for your uh, evidence, for your post presentation Q and A, for um, you know, for, for the data that if they want to pour over and find out, they can. Just uh, pull out what helps, right? Don't get into the weeds. Keep things high level. Know your know you know your the the know the numbers. Know the you know know your break evens. Know know exactly. Um, you know those important uh, numbers and and where you got that data but don't include it don't put it on the the slides uh don't um you know don't don't make your your slides money don't uh, muddy rather i'm sorry um yeah uh, know your target market know your beachhead target market uh, but you don't need to necessarily put every uh, everything about that particular market on there you know when it, you know, the very first presentation about uh, customer discovery, customer discovery is everything. It's the backbone of entrepreneurship. It's so much of what we do. Uh, and that leads, you know, leads into our, into our uh, market projections and our uh, understanding of the market is understanding those customers. Uh, and, and remember that you, you know, investors are going to want to see large numbers. So you do want to see a large TAM, uh, but at, on the same token, on the other hand, they also want to see a, a very narrow, a very niche, a very focused, focused initial uh, target market. Your early adopters, your beachhead should be very specific, very niche. And, and that's not because um, we want you to stay small or we think that... Um, 
you know, like you can't handle be, being being big. You will grow faster. You will uh, do better. The more narrow, the more niche, the more specific your initial um, target market is. And so always keep in mind that you're, you're um, you know, take that focus strategy. Uh, so just to quickly, I know we're almost out of time, but uh, quickly, I will say that um, when you take that focus strategy, keep your, um, you know, your initial company should have a, a very s uh, simple, single uh, product or service offering. Y you want to keep that initial target market uh, geographically close to home. Uh, even if you have a business that's uh, heavily reliant on uh, like online sales, you still want to keep that initial early target market close to home. And you want to do, um, you want to do what you do uh, well. You want to have a superior product, superior service. And just remember, having that niche market is the best way to be successful. It's going to keep you from uh, being, it's going to keep you from being uh, knocked out of the of the game by the larger uh, competition uh, they're less likely to pay attention to you if you're if you're small and narrow uh, in the beginning it helps you so that you can have that initial concierge service when you are when you are um, developing your and testing your MVP so they don't need to know necessarily who's behind the curtain and you can seem like a big company while uh, while doing everything very concierge uh, in the in the back behind the curtain. Um, and then you really become an expert in what you do. You get that reputation as being a leader. You, you, you start to form those strong relationships and you can defend those strong relationships and it's cheaper, right? It's cheaper because you don't have so much uh, marketing costs, so much uh, operational costs. Remember uh, that every single, every single market um, or every single, uh, yeah, every single uh, segment market should be its own market. If if they uh, if you would have to advertise to this particular group differently, so it's okay to have a very specific, very niche initial target market. And um, remember that customers don't buy products or services; they buy solutions to pro problems. And so define them in relationship to that solution to the problem. And when you're finding those first early adopters, know that these are the this is the the initial group this initial niche group of people that have the problem that you're solving. They know they have the problem that you're solving and they're actively so seeking a solution to that problem. Those are the people that you first are targeting. Those are your early adopters. And, um, and later you can capture, um, you know, more, more of the market, but um, yeah, I'm not going to get too much into these uh, other uh, details about, about segmenting to the market, but I wanted to put them in here or segmenting the markets rather. I wanted to put it in here so that you could, um, you know, have access to this information because you have this PowerPoint slide. And I did give you, I did give you a few more, a few more things, uh, a few more resources in here for you to have access to, including, um, uh, you know, how to, how to explain your revenue model to include that revenue model um, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. I have lots, lots of other uh, information in here for you uh, to help you with your PowerPoints, to help you with your presentations. And I hope, I hope this was helpful. I'm going to stop that there and answer any other questions that if I have enough time uh, that anybody has. Yeah, you have time. So you guys raise your hand and we'll queue up, get your answers, your questions answered. Cause this is kind of the tricky part of those slides. Okay, we, we've got some line, we got some questions being queued up. Right. Um, so I don't know who was first on there, but ah, let's see here. Ah, Tanya, where am I? So I see we have hand raised. Uh, Nicolo, Nicolo, um, question? Uh, yeah, I was wondering. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I know you were saying that, uh, like calculating the industry size and kind of dividing it uh, yeah. by how many companies are in it, it is not the best approach. But what if the industry is not too fragmented? Like, Let's say that there's not many um, companies in that in that industry, and uh, maybe like one out of ten uh, could be. You know, if we were one out of, out of ten of those in uh, those companies, would it make sense to like estimate that we could aim to an eight to ten percent of, of of market share? So okay, so for us, so you're talking about for estimating your share of market for uh, a realistic share of market. Uh, yeah. So so. Okay, so I mean, what I would recommend doing is is looking and seeing what happened 
what happened. I always want to know what happened before, right? For me, it's always about like what actually happened in the past. What can I show that actually happened either in that industry or in similar industries as well? I mean, it doesn't necessarily even have to be that particular industry if, um, you know, if there's something that's somewhat similar and you can sh show that. So if you can find information on what actually already happened, that's going to give you much better uh, much better predictor uh, information for, for you that, than um, necessarily, oh, well, there's, you know, five companies in here. So I'm going to say we're going to get 20% market share. That's not the way that you want to do it. That's not going to, you know, that's not uh, realistic, you know. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. That makes sense. Makes sense. All right. Good luck. Good luck. And, and 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 then we could always go the the method that Joshua did too. Ask other people if you have a mentor that's in a, that similar industry. Hey, you know, what happened to you in your first few years? How much market share were you able to capture? Things like that. Okay. Uh, Jeff. What, what were you gonna say, Amy? Amy. You oh well, a... um, Nicola reminded me that you had a an announcement about a food and beverage opportunity. I just, oh I just, yes. I just Thank that. You. Oh my goodness! And Nicola was actually part of the of, of one of the cohorts that we uh, just finished up. So. If you are in the food and beverage industry, if you uh, have a company uh, and it can be a home-based, we love the Miko's home-based uh, food business. We have grant funds available again for you. Uh, so uh, the the way that it works is um, we give you eight weeks of training on um business uh, principles and uh, we help you with uh, licensing and we help you um, get everything legal for your business side you 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 work on the food part we help you with all the business part after those eight weeks you get a grant from us uh, between 2500 and 7500 that you can use to buy equipment or hire people or do marketing or whatever else you need to do and um <clears throat> and the next cohort is going to start up again in april uh we we've already helped now 200 entrepreneurs uh and given away seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. we have another million dollars to give away and so um yeah we'll be able to help you if you have a food business and give you money uh, so if you if you have if you, later on if you get a link a so i'll give you a link, link and send steve in the link we'll get it up to people so yeah. I'll okay, help I'll moderate. We got Jeff Gottschalk next in line. We got about three or four minutes left. Jeff, what can I do for you? Okay, thank you. No, I love the topic of focus. So I really appreciate you bringing attention to that. And that's something that I'm on the daily trying to not go after that shiny object. Yeah. I would say, what have you seen? Obviously, everybody is different and circumstances are different. And like, again, like Josh alluded to, I probably could maybe find a model or something like that to maybe ask a, someone that has a similar scenario. But in your experience, you know, where have you seen it make sense where either people could start really actually looking at like going a little bit broader if they do in the general sense have a bigger kind of play that they would like to go into other categories what maybe when have you seen it make sense that they were able to kind of transition to a little bit broader audience? So I've seen a lot of uh, I've seen a lot of companies uh, capture capture a lot of market share and, and a lot of, um, you know, and sell a lot of products and services. But it's not usually by broadening their target markets. It's by narrowing those target markets and then just having more of them, right? I mean, it just, I, I always try to think, would I advertise to these two people the same way? Would I advertise to this, uh, you know, would I create the same commercial for this group as I would for this group? If there's a different way that you would reach them, if there's a different way that you would communicate with them, then I think this is a different market. And and yes, I, maybe uh, we add another, uh, another market to the mix, um, you know, but those are all sort of growth strategy this sort of growth strategy um considerations uh and initially you know keep it simple keep it keep it focused initially and then dominate that industry dominate it like you know you own that particular segment then you can start getting some of those other segments and then they'll come easier you know yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you thank it's you. hard it's i know it is hard it's hard to do and, yeah. and it's counterintuitive Right, because why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I go bigger? Right, I want more. I want more, but you're not going to get them if you if you you know yeah. So. Yeah, thank you. Yes, of course. And then I saw another. Um, it was uh, Ebram again. Yeah, I think I I really enjoy when you went to this uh, 
pitch head market and you mentioned about make it focus and become champion or maybe is this true that if if we start with customer discovery, inside our customer discovery, we can figure out that which group we want to focus initially and make it very clear that customer discovery approve it or validate it, that that is the group that you can shine and yes. make, it, make it clear. Yeah. I think that's, yeah, I think that's a, a great use of customer discovery. Absolutely. And, and, and honestly, if you, you know, uh, I love also the way that you said, uh, you know, d discovering or finding that that target market, because so often people think that they're choosing a target market. You should not be choosing a target market. You should be discovering a market. You should be figuring out what that market is and not trying to shove something down somebody's throat who doesn't want it. Right. Yeah. You know, find the people that want it. Find the people that are asking you for it. That's what you should be doing in your discovery. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. I appreciate. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Is there any other questions before we? I think we might not be out of time, anyways. Yeah, we're kind of at the end. Um, yeah, <laughs> I just want to like dovetail on that last comment about discovering the target market, and like you can't. It goes a little bit back to what Benton said. Like, if you're, you know, you're sitting there at your customer discovery to ask what your need is, and if you're like, hey, but would you need this? Like, you're not listening they're telling you what their need is. They don't need that. Like, cause everybody wants to jump and start selling. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. That's why it's so important not to tell them a darn thing about what you do, because the second you start explaining you're selling, right. Instead, mm -hmm. listen, listen to what they want. Listen to what they, yeah, that's a gr great point. Just such a great yeah. point. And I had someone actually, and then I, I've had this question a couple of times where um, there's several markets that someone can go after. And they're like, well, what if I opened up three different businesses and allow them? And, and I'm like, which one is the best? Yeah, investors are going to just want everybody just wants the best. They don't mm -hmm. want choice. They don't want you, right? I, well, I'm going to go after all these segments at the same time, which you can't do anyway because you don't have enough money and resources. Right, right. Yeah, wait, wait until you wait until you've got a, a just a huge pool of money to do that. Yeah, why wouldn't you just go after the best? Yes, you can. You can start a hundred businesses, a thousand businesses. Who cares? Which is the best? Which is the most uh, the highest probability of making you the most money the quick the quickest? Where are you going to have uh, you know customers smiling happily just handing you money? Right. Yeah, that's that's what you got to find. Yeah. You know. All right, so we do. So we 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 have a break built in right now. But I are these new hands up or hands that just didn't go down? I think they didn't go down. Yeah. I, <laughs> okay, we have another. I had another hand. I had another hand. Uh, okay. When you were saying like don't expand into too many segments, I was wondering, but would it make sense to if, if there is the potential for expanding in other segments, would it make sense to include those in a pitch deck as an option that might be attractive for I don't know if some if if they have the the resources to 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 explore those those channels personally i would say focus on focus on the best right and initially is what i would say but i don't know amy do you have a different opinion on that yeah i think that's what you when your beachhead is that low-hanging fruit with the people you know the if you can make a sale today who where are you gonna who what door would you knock on or what conference would you go to or that's what you do now and then you're like and once i saturate that or i and then i'm going to move into the next market so that's your plan you tell the investors because you they don't want to hear I'm going to sell it all to everybody all at the same time. Yeah, that's okay. the worst thing you can say. That's the absolute. Yeah, no, no, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But just giving you know yeah, yeah, yeah. options for different channels of revenue, I think it, it just. Down uh, the road, yeah. uh, but as long as you understand it, if you understand, like I understand it's there, and I, but yeah. I know what the 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 channel that's going to work for me first, and then when I make that happen and I become very revenue generating, and then I can plow that into the other the other channels so as long as it's just like a very like thought out methodical plan about how you go from one to the other sort of like okay. again all, all yeah the... yeah and people can see that too that they know that you actually get it and you're not just a oh, okay let's do this all now we, you know yeah okay it makes sense makes sense thank you okay i have to fix my link in the chat so okay well thank you tanya thank you so much for that this was excellent they and tanya brought her class also so we sort of also ran a class tonight too so we're going to give you guys um uh, how about like, I don't know, two or three minutes. We're going to, I'm going to fix the link in the chat. And uh, Taya is going to queue up the breakout rooms. So let us give us a few minutes to do that. And then um, we'll do those breakout rooms. And um, those will go, go until, the breakout rooms will go until 820. And then we'll close up and have final thoughts. So give us a few minutes and then 
don't go far, but yeah, take your little bio break if you need it. Yeah, I'm going to go take one myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tanya, so much. And those rooms are queued up, so. Uh, what are we talking about in the breakout rooms? All right. So thank you for your question. So the All right, well, yeah, I can maybe staff. answer it when people are back. I didn't mean to like jump on it. I was just no, that's like fine. thinking. That's fine. We'll, I'll just sort of slowly talk and I'll repeat myself again. So <laughs> okay. um, if you have Zoom, well, you do. So make sure it's expanded, like open it up to your full, your full screen. And everybody's Zoom, I think is a little bit different. But when I look at my Zoom and I go to the very bottom, there's like a horizontal row of icons. One of them says breakout rooms and there's like four, four square. And if you click on that, um, she's working on it. She's going to let you choose a breakout room. Okay, I don't, I'm just getting like. Um, yeah, I haven't launched them yet because that will kind of like throw a option onto everyone's screen. All right, that's where it's gonna be. Yeah. And I also forgot I have, I have like host visibility. So I see things you can't see. So if you can't see the breakout room icon, um, make sure you're clicking more the three dots. That's usually where it's hiding if it's not expanded enough. Maybe, and you know what we can, um, since we didn't really kind of have a soft like break with you know, a couple of minutes time. So we could put the directions in the chat um, and let people just start getting in there and chatting away. Well, how's that sound, Peyton? Sure. So you want me to open those now or you want to give an audible? Yeah, go ahead and open them now. And so now, uh, okay, I don't know, it might've popped up on your screen like it did for me. So we're all unassigned. And if you, it'll say shoot, let's see, there's four rooms. If you scroll down, all the way down, you can see the rooms and all you have to do is click join the room. That, and you feel free to un, you know move around the rooms if you like, or maybe your business is kind of hybrid for those, for the areas. So we are, if you go to your breakout room button on the bottom, you might see a button that says breakout room or it might be under more. When you click on that, you'll see the, and you just click the join button for the room that fits as close as, you can find a fit for what you're doing. And I think our team will, oh, Misty is, is Misty. So we'll, you know, we'll probably, you know, divide and conquer and join a room and just help moderate, but it is like peer advisory. It's peer advising. You guys advise each other. So pick a room. Talk about your market size, customer discovery. We got seven in food and beverage. I see four in biotech life science, 13 in SaaS and software. Healthcare's got seven. Hi there. Are, what, Hi. Are, what are we supposed to talk about? Did we decide, did you guys decide or? It's peer, it's peer. Like uh, peer. we want you guys, yeah. Find, talk amongst your peers. Like how are you guys doing it? And okay. Very good. All right, thank you. Yeah. If our team, we could bop into those rooms that people joined earlier on and just reiterate that if it's necessary. Yeah, if our team can join in. Mm -hmm. Wow, software is big. That would be worth going in to see if that needs to be split up. There might be, I think there's ed tech going on that might be big enough. I think I'm going to join that and see what's going on in software and SaaS and then um, 
So people, you know, they're muted and walked away. <laughs> So you're going to software, Amy? Looks like she went into a software SaaS. Softwares. Not the hardware, it's just the software. Need more softwares. I think I'll head into the uh, food bev and CPG room and uh, try to capture some of that. Cool. Bro. Good about saying that. So, most important thing for me as an investor um, would be that you can explain it. So what I would do is first start with something you can explain that sounds reasonable and then get some feedback from there. Like I used this uh, for this reason, if that makes sense. And then um, you'll get some feedback. They'll always find something. So you know how to be thick skinned. I'm sure all of you, um, but they'll always find uh, something. But that's that would be the best approach. Just start with something, right? Start with something and get it no. up there into a chart, Sorry. and uh, and I f I will find that um, then it will kind of develop over time. So don't be scared, Patty. Give your one minute. You can do it. Oh, no, no, no. That's I, I actually I'm not, that part I'm not worried about at all. What happened was I um, I listened to the first couple one minutes and realized that I what I had was much too abbreviated and I needed to just do kind of a um you know quick and dirty version of the three minute. But for, for Nicolo I have a suggestion on on for help on that. There's a group here in San Diego that I belong to called Naturally San Diego. Oh yeah. And, and do you know that group? Yeah I'm I'm a member. Yeah I'm a member. Oh yeah. well hey I'm a member too. So oh, cool. there's cool. bound yeah, to be there's bound to be people there who can really help you to find the market. I yeah, would get hold get oh, hold of uh, Kirsten and ask her to set you up, you know, or go to one of the coffees and just start talking to some of the board people. They're gonna know. Um yeah. they'll help you get that dialed in. Nicola, one thing that I was thinking about um, as you were talking. So I feel for the purposes of pitching, you might want to just focus on that one thing that is your largest, you know, kind of addressable. And, and this yeah. is the example that I would bring up. Like, so like Gatorade, for example, Gatorade is, is, a product that is okay it's after sports drink to replenish your electrolytes so that's you know it, it's gator aid it was made at the university of florida for the gators that was sort of its initial application and then that's how it kind of spread but also it's the best sports drink for anyone not just florida football players it could be anyone and have you ever been hung over you know if you're lacking electrolytes did you ever think about you could drink think about how many people are hung over every single weekend these are all like channels and addressable like uses very realistic and probably greater than yeah. the like initial thing but when gatorade probably if they were in this and they were pitching gatorade they would be like what are we doing we're doing electrolyte replenishment for football players you know what i mean and then maybe as as uh, sort of Lucy was saying, you know, uh, you can kind of you're knowledgeable to be like, but also there's all these other applications that could even explode this even bigger and really make this a ubiquitous product for everyday use. But I think for the purposes, because I'm in a similar boat, dude, I have, you know, yeah. coffees, teas, like these mushroom powder things. And I'm like, they're all kind of like addressing something. But yeah. what I'm kind of trying to figure out for this pitch is what is the like one use one product one thing that is the that just like a home run and then you're going to sell an investor on and then you know you're it's easier in the operations of the business to roll out all these other yeah. things you know yeah, like, where that's are you my gonna thought i don't know fire where are you going to start the fire and then you know 
Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. beachhead, the beat your beachhead market kind of makes sense because it's like, you know, you're storming just the beach. Yeah, you got to go take out a lot of other bunkers and you know, the war is is inland, but what's the beach that you're starting at to like get the ball rolling, you know? And just making it a very clear, uh, you know, I also kind of think about this as, as it being a story. It's like, it's got to be so like simple to follow the plot that as soon as you start getting into the complexities of the directions that your business can go, I feel like the possibility, yeah. it happened to me in my pitch. I don't know if you were there the other day, but they were like, it, it, I mean, Brenton's uh, number one question was like, so what is your product? Like, what do you do? Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> And it's because it's yeah. it's easy if you have multiple applications or like a, a product family to kind of for that to get lost in the like yeah. word salad, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. That makes sense. That makes sense. I'm already envisioning what I'm going to say. Honestly, yeah. Yeah, me too. I'm doing I'm doing the yeah. same thing, man. I'm, yeah. I'm like, all right, well, I've got to trim this. I got to focus that a little bit more. And, and then yeah. it probably helps a little bit with the research component too, because you know, this already seems like a pain in the ass and you got to do it for every possible addressable market. And exactly. the so you be doing this all day like, for the rest of your life, you know? So yeah. I think it, maybe just for the sake of the pitch and whatever it, and focus, it'll, it'll help to focus, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Hi everyone. If you, um, I didn't realize we could record in breakout rooms. Um, yeah, no. If you if you uh, specifically want to uh, want to talk to somebody in a specific, oh, so so SAS, you said SAS. Yes. You know the best people who I always I always whenever I have a SAS question I always ask. Um, do you know Logic Boost Labs? No. Uh, okay, so Logic Boost Labs, they're um they they do uh. I think that they're like uh, yeah they are they're a venture capital firm they're a venture capital firm but they also um they also just help a, a lot of the you know startups because they're mentors at, at the rec um here and they like anytime I have anything SaaS or anything like, like super uh, heavy tech I always turn it over to them so maybe um I'll be happy to do an email introduction with uh, with one of the founders from there he's a super sweet guy they're actually hosting a meetup um uh, oh, like tomorrow. tomorrow at the San Diego Tech Startup Week. That's right. I forgot it's about that. Uh, Liberty Station. Mm -hmm. Liberty. St what time is that at? Uh, let me look on my calendar. Yeah. I think it's like four to six. Oh, it's actually, yeah, it's tomorrow, five to nine at the lot in Liberty Station. Yeah. Are you, um, are you able to go there, Zachary, or... Uh, you know, I saw the registration had closed. I didn't know if they were going to still let people in or register or if it was a week long thing, man mandating you, all attendance or. Yeah, it's like a ticket based thing. You have to purchase tickets. Have you already, I mean, are you already in, uh, I mean, have you already got tickets for the, uh, for startup week? No. Okay. Do you want, um, is anybody from startup week here in this room with me? Anybody who's like from startup week? Okay. I I'm had ending, but I'm not like. And I, I have tickets here. Let me give you let me give you a link here. So we have tickets through the rec um, um, as a, because we're partners with them. And I tell you what, if you, I'll give you a $200 ticket. If you, in exchange one day, come visit me for mentor hours and uh, answer questions to my students who are starting companies. Sound like a fair that's, trade? That's okay. a yes. I'm giving you the heart signal. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Okay, I'll give you guys, I'll put it in this. 100%. Offer, yeah, the offer is open to anyone in the room here. I'm going to give you guys my my code because I bought tickets. Okay, so you can go to any of the events um, this week. Today, they're down in Tijuana. On Thursday, they're doing pitch competition. Um, Star the tickets, free tickets. Yeah, Thursday is the lightweight pitch competition for early stage ventures. And then Friday is for growth stage ventures and it's the heavyweight competition. And then after each event, they're having like a kind of happy hour mixer kind of thing. Fun. Well, I'm going to the Thursday one because I have students who are pitching to that one, but not the uh, not the other one. So I'll see you there. Yay. Okay. Are you pitching? Oh, no, I wish. I just found out about it like last week. So um. Cool. I was able to uh, get that same connect that you're giving everyone here from awesome. my advisor, Sylvia Ma. So. Oh, I love Sylvia. She, she, she is, is the best person. Okay, so <laughs> I'm putting the link in the chat. 
Wait, where is the chat? Zoom one. Checked. Here's the here's the link to register, and here's my unique code is REC100. And Aha, then, lovely. Ah, $200 value, mm -mm, tickets. So um, yeah, and if you go on Thursday, I'll definitely be there. But oh, and tomorrow, tomorrow for logic. Oh, but I have a presentation. Let me look at my calendar. Mm -hmm. If if not, I can do, I'd be happy to do an email introduction too, uh, to Chris. Let me give you my, my email. You can just send me a, at sdsu.edu. That's my email address. Yeah. And um, what was I looking up? I, I'm losing my mind. Oh, I know my schedule tomorrow. Tomorrow is, oh yeah, Point Loma Logic Boost Labs, 5 p.m. to, I don't know when. I might be able to go to that because I have the advisor. It's five to nine, yeah. Yeah, I might be able to go to that. I might be able to go to that. So I might um, I might be able to go to that if, if any of you are going to, to that. That's specifically for more tech startups, SaaS kind of startups, that particular event. And um yeah, I'll go. I'll go. I'll, 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 if you go, I'll probably see you guys there. But if you would like an email introduction, um, I'd be happy to, to do that too. Thank you so much. Yeah, he's a good person to ask. Yeah. Cool, guys. Um, did anybody? I'm sorry I missed the beginning of the bre breakout room. Um, yeah, I don't know if, if anybody or what we were doing, if we were just uh, discussing or asking each other. Just connecting or, or I just what, started what, off the conversation by asking if anyone had a pricing strategy in mind or had done some research on their pricing thus far. Mm -hmm. Are you pricing your products right now? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a tough one. Pricing is really difficult. Um, yeah. I've had experience in the past of pricing, um, but I, I don't love pricing. Yeah. Yo, Victoria, are you also pricing something right now? Yeah, I shared kind of my thoughts about around my pricing. I'm creating an AI powered virtual assistant app um, and I'd like to, it, you know, make it available to pretty much anyone. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of thinking like lower price point, um, like a $9.99 a month kind of Netflix subscription model um, and just change the mentality around. Like I was saying, like, people think now like, oh, you have an assistant, you made it in life. And normally there's a luxury kind of high price ticket associated okay. with that. Yeah. So by switching it kind of like, I feel like Netflix did that. It's like the movies, you know, was a luxury to go to the movies. And like now people don't even go to the movies anymore because they can stream them mm -hmm. on their devices for 10 bucks a month. And people don't bat an eye for a yeah. subscription like that. Yeah. So a tool that could, you know, 10 X your productivity for 10 bucks a month. I think I'll see the sales that I'm looking for in a very short amount of time that way. Have you tried um, doing any like, uh, you know, with, with, were you um, like any, any trade-offs uh, like, uh, like asking people to, 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 it's hard, you know, pricing, you can't just ask people how much you're going to pay. They don't ever tell you what they're going to pay. They say less, they say more. It's, it's so difficult. But uh, one thing that I found that, that worked really well, I don't know if it would work in this, it probably could, is, is asking them to kind of tr trade off like, like saying you get this for this or you could trade this for this and you know i don't know i don't know you you you, you definitely want to take your time with pricing because you could totally leave so much money on the table and not even know it if you if you're not smart about your pricing decisions you know what i mean like you my could competition is like overseas vas right so we're uh -huh. talking about like the best ones in the philippines or indonesia probably charging like eight dollars an hour so, you know, if you're using them 20 hours a week, which I would say most people that use like a VA is part-time like 20 hours a week. Yeah, there's money being left on the table, but then it's only project space and you get more money subscription. So that's kind of where I'm basing my pricing off of is, you know, you can pay $8 an hour for somebody who's in a different time zone, who speaks a different native language than you. Or but maybe they're not even thinking of that when they're thinking of, of about the pricing. Um, you know, like maybe, maybe when your customers are thinking about it, they're thinking about it like a, um, like a subscription to, uh, you know, like the first thing that came to my head, you know, it's stupid, but I was thinking like my, like YouTube premium subscription. I was like, I wonder how much that is. I wonder how much, it, I mean, which is stupid because I'm not thinking at all about how much does my executive assistant cost me? I, I didn't even think about that when you said it. So, you know, you never know what people are thinking about. And 
And maybe, I mean, maybe they'd be willing to pay 20, 30 bucks and you would just have a small drop off of people. Uh, you know, who knows? I, that's why pricing is so important. You could, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I actually have more recent experiences uh, on that. So, uh, but yeah, I would check that out. They may have some updated. I know uh, John, uh, uh, Youngson is actually rebranding. So it's actually growing its data science portfolio quite a lot. Uh, I have a lot of connections there as well. So. Good. What are the possibilities that, you know, we can get it to JLabs? Because my application under review right now uh, with the JLabs and also with the Blue Knight, uh, uh, Blue Knight partnership with the Blue Knight. So both of them are uh, reviewing my application because you know, I'm working on uh, molecular glues for a targeted protein degradation in oncology and uh, CNS. Initially, I'm working on oncology. So uh, so what are the possibilities that, you know, JLabs uh, call for the next step? Well, you can just set up an, uh, an application for JLabs. You you there's some online website thing where you put in your uh, i forgot what they're i'm not sure what all they require i've done that you know actually i've done that you know uh, right now my application is, is under review by j labs yeah it's under re yeah and then you probably need to follow up with them too okay so i think with like with the big companies they a lot of times things fall through the cracks and so you've got to be the squeaky wheel to keep it going yeah Okay, I think we still have a few more minutes. <laughs> is there any other, is there any investors that, um, you know, that we can reach out to uh, specific investors in the, in the area of oncology or, or, um, or in a CNS, direct investors that we can speak on this, you know, with respect to uh, my subject, like targeted protein degradation right. space? Uh, there, there's Cancer Fund in Arizona. So will they will they give us a funding because we are in California? Uh, so will they give us a funding or it is only Arizona based? Uh, 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 I don't think they're limited geographically, but uh, okay, approach them. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. So, uh, so I would imagine since you are in the uh, oncology field, right, primarily in the in terms of therapeutic, uh, you know, um, you, you should be not only applying for J Labs. Probably you should be applying for many other opportunities around. So you will see which ones give you better chances. And you know, in terms of reviewers, it may be different. You know, body of you know reviewers as well. So they might have yeah. uh, different kind of feedback that could be you know really helpful. Yeah, I applied actually. I applied for uh, Y Combinator. You know, they are also reviewing my application. Mm -hmm. uh, J Labs is one more, and also a couple of uh, investor, you know, venture mm -hmm. capitalists are also reviewing my application. But mm -hmm. but still, mm -hmm. now I did not get any kind of a response initially. But I also mm -hmm. applied for a SBI grant, uh, mm -hmm. which is also under review. Mm -hmm. cool. so did Did you set up a laboratory someplace yet, or? No, actually, I'm looking for you know uh, uh, different um, uh, uh, incubation centers like Aquilius is one one incubation center, and the Y Combinator I applied you know they're they're um, showing more much interest in um, uh, in San Francisco and one more in uh, Carlsbad, uh, one more incubation center that I'm also looking for, but basically you know uh, initially I'm looking for initial some kind of funding that I uh, you know to to. Uh, to step into all these things, right? You know, uh, right. so that's what I'm looking for. You know, um, yeah. right, and especially if you're starting up a company that has to do with cell culture, it will run through a lot of money quickly. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. If anybody is interested in my area or targeted protein degradation, you can also join with me. Yeah, that will be great helpful because you have you have lots of lots of experience. I am just a, a started yeah. company only two uh, two months back in the month of August. So I'm uh, but in a, uh, mm -hmm. as you know that molecular glues are very hot um, right now in targeted protein degradation. Okay. Lots of um, market size and you know there is very crazy deals is going on right now uh, in the area of molecular glue. So uh, 
right. if anybody is interested, you know, please, uh, uh, yeah. please. Would you uh, mind you can... dropping LinkedIn somewhere so we could uh, find you after the meeting? So I sent the invite, you. you know, I sent the invite for both of you, but I was unable to find out oh, uh, okay. Brian uh, uh, mm -hmm. Byron word. Yeah, I do. I do see actually. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'm not unable to find the you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Byron Ward actually. I... Right. So we got cut off. <laughs> That's the, I hope I hope you got I hope you had such a great ex discussion going on that you got cut off because that's we like the breakout rooms to 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 just drive this vibrant community. Um, and if you come back, we'll always have breakout rooms. If you come back in person, you can like just chat in the while we're having pizza. Um, so anyone want it? We've got like we got nine minutes. We're gonna let you all go at eight thirty. Uh, anyone want to raise their hand and get in line? Like any big aha moments or things you found out hmm. still noodling on it they said okay garrett um so i guess i'm kind of learning that it's it's the tam tam song is really like the design process just like the uh the customer discovery it's all like a design process it's continuous you know you, you keep like every single deck that you make you circle back and and you know take the customer discovery net that you've casted and then readjust and get, make a, make a different kind of uh, outline of, of your Tam Sam song. Um, and that's kind of where I'm at right now. And, um, you know, it, it kind of is a little bit daunting, you know, where, where it's going, but I just got to keep everything organized in my head, I guess. And, and uh, yeah, iter iterate for sure. If I'm like here, I hear you with organizing it, find a way to like where you are today, keep hold that somewhere. And then where you're going and and as you continue like spreadsheets whatever works for you if you're kind of an organized thought person but because you're gonna get new information the dynamics of the market are going to change so it's iterating for sure okay nicola uh, yeah i think i think we we were talking about kind of like targeting different you know revenue streams and or different markets with the same product i think we came up with maybe it makes more sense to focus on uh, whatever makes more sense and make that fire kind of start. And then once it gets going, then start branching out. But instead of marketing to a larger market, maybe pick that niche or or a trendy, something that's trending versus a more saturated one before yeah. the other. That sounds good. That, yep, we got an exactly from the professor. <laughs> Very good. All right. Anyone else? We got a few minutes here. Were that were the breakout rooms right? Should I mean this might be a chat thing, or if you want to raise your hand, maybe was there is there a we we thought there might be enough ed tech people we could like have their own breakout room. So we just want to make sure it's like you're with the peer group that is serving you. So and like just understanding the community that arrives every day. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, that's what too. All right, let's see. Yeah, all right. So, okay. Anything from the speakers want to raise your hand or just unmute? Anybody will have final thoughts? We're working on closing it down now. Yes, to Garrett's point, it is very much um, agile design process, continuous improvement. And every time you make a deck or every time you make a spreadsheet, make sure that you rename it and you'll be able to go back and see the progress. Um, I've seen, I've seen uh, good founders that have literally a hundred versions of a deck inside of a fundraising campaign that lasts six weeks um, because they're always incorporating the latest comments. And it's a good, it's a good process. It can be frustrating. And what was your word daunting? Um, but 
if you look back at the history and, and watch the evolution, sometimes you'll see how quickly you can pivot and change and improve. And that's pretty exciting. Um, you know, we're, we're not chasing perfection, as Tanya said. And the concept of wabi-sabi, which is the Japanese term for there are great perfections in, in, in every imperfect thing, I think is always a good philosophy to have when you're trying to come up with something brand new, right? So um, stick with the process and make notes and you'll be surprised when you look back. Yeah, there is no the right there there's no right answer that we will ever no. discover how many actual people in the world are buying coffee pods so you got to be comfortable <laughs> in that so lucy montgomery from the sba has her hand raised lucy what you got thank you so much great work speakers great work amy great work misty benton uh, professor hertz uh Excellent for everyone. I just want to, to say on behalf of the SBA, thank you uh, for putting this on for our entrepreneurs and our community and for the entrepreneurs, keep working hard, don't give up and uh, keep attending these events. Every single time you're learning something and getting better and making your community better. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for those comments. I love that you said that and I, I'm so happy that you attended because this is what it's all about. It's it's allowing, it's helping founders like you innovate, provide advising, peer group like this. So this was this was an, a, a really spectacular event tonight. So I, thank you all for coming. Thanks to the speakers for your talks. Thanks for our staff putting on the breakout rooms and handling kind of the hurting the cats behind the scenes. And so just I'll leave you with next week. The next event is not going to be on Tuesday because that's Halloween. So you go out and have fun, and then it'll be on Wednesday on November 1st in person at USD, and we're going to be talking about the whole theme is competitive and competitive advantage. We're going to have a, some founders being interviewed, and we'll, we'll give you a little bit more detail as we, um, as we get that. Just follow the LinkedIn and um, the email. So with that, I will release you all to your evening, and thanks again for coming. Thanks, Thank you for a great event. Thank you.